Hello world, um, welcome back to Stacking Wisdom Podcast, and today we're here, uh, your hosts Artem and Alex, and today we have Claire with us. Hi Claire. Hi. Uh, thank you for being on our show, uh, thank you for coming today. Um, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Obviously we have your book here today, you're obviously involved in you know food business. Um, tell us about more about yourself, your brand, what are you trying to achieve, what are your goals, where are you going with with your, you know, with your business, and you're obviously are working for yourself. Tell us more about that as well. Uh, okay, so my name is Claire Tansy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm a food writer. Um, I do a number of different things. Um, food writing is a pretty big basket of things. So mm-hmm. it's anything from uh, recipe development to uh, presentations, uh, TV, radio, uh, write for various mm-hmm. magazines and papers. Um, and then I do work with food clients as well. And then I have a book out, a cookbook that just came out in October. That's amazing. I, I've actually seen this book I was, I was mentioning earlier. I've seen it, I think, a, a, a number of different bookstores and even Costco. We were, we were talking about that briefly, right? Yeah, it's, it, uh, it's great. It's, I, I went with a traditional publisher, so I went mm-hmm. with Penguin Canada, which yeah. is a nice big publisher. And so they got a lot of distribution for it. So it's, mm-hmm. um, it's doing really well. Excellent. Yeah, which is fantastic. Of course, that's what you want. Um, and I can talk about the book as it relates to the business uh-huh. um, because it's actually, a, it's much more a business piece than it is a passion project or anything like that. Sure. Uh, although my whole business is really a passion project of sorts. Uh-huh. Um, I, I, I started in this, on this path, I was a chef, so I was in university doing an undergrad degree in drama, so a completely useless degree. But I had a job working in a kitchen, and that's how I got sort of paid for university. And then, mm-hmm. so when I graduated from undergrad, I went and did an apprenticeship and became a chef mm-hmm. and worked for many years. Um, and then uh, two things. First of all, I had a back injury. It was very hard for me to stand mm-hmm. for 16 hours a day. And second of all, it's just restaurant work is very boring because in the restaurant world, consistency is what you're after. So Absolutely. you want to come to the restaurant and have the exact same dish tonight as you mm-hmm. had in six months and six months ago so consistency mm-hmm. is the key and that's ultimately for a creative person quite boring mm-hmm. for sure I, uh, I agree 100%. Yeah. and also yeah. as a woman we know it's all come out in the open now about women in kitchens but mm-hmm. it's mm-hmm. not a pretty place for a woman a woman to work so it, it's mm-hmm. difficult for sure yeah. <laughs> it's mm-hmm. difficult yeah. uh, it certainly toughens you up a lot but uh, for better or for worse mm-hmm. so I went back to school and got uh, my master's degree in English uh, and sort of literary stuff uh, and then I sort of tried to figure out how was I going to do this, take the chef training and take the literature and uh, like kind of advanced education sure, and mash them together. I was living in Guelph, uh-huh. um, so I did my master's degree and I was reading Chatelaine magazine, with the, probably at the chiropractor because I had such <laughs> ongoing back problems. Oh, and I read in the masthead of Chatelaine that they had a test kitchen and uh-huh, I thought, uh-huh. oh, test kitchen, like that's something. Uh-huh, that uh-huh. seems like the perfect uh, melding. So uh, I moved to Toronto. Uh, to try to get a job at Chatelaine. I was in 2002 and so then uh, that would begin the first my the first leg of my freelance career so 2002 until about 2005 uh, I freelanced for everywhere everything in the food business I was teaching classes for Loblaws for the LCBO I was doing recipe development for whoever would take me I started writing restaurant reviews for Mm -hmm. the now defunct iWeekly that became the grid and now the business um, and for Toronto Life, um, so I started just you know patching together a, a life, and this was hmm. at a time before, before food had really exploded Taken off, yeah. in the way it has. Mm-hmm. Like the Food Network existed, it was all what we call dump and stir <laughs> shows. So you know, like Ina mm-hmm. Garten, Anna Olson, all those mm-hmm. people, great, mm-hmm. fantastic. Blogs weren't really a thing. Obviously, Facebook didn't exist. None of that stuff existed. So it was a sort of a time of innocence <laughs> before it all exploded. Um, so it was a great time to be young in the business because you could people would take a chance on you. And if you were a good writer and you knew something about food, you could actually uh, pull it together. So I had a lot of different types of jobs. Um, and then in 2005, I was offered a full-time job at uh, Loblaw mm-hmm. at President's Choice running their product development kitchen. Wow, that's, a, that's amazing. So that was that's great. a huge right? company, especially yeah, now. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Now, it was at Young and St. Clair at the time, mm-hmm. which was like I could take the subway. I didn't have a car. I didn't have a driver's license. I was 25. <laughs> well, in Toronto, you can get away with other stuff like that, right? Completely. Because like, it's, it's, it's just so close, right? Yeah, and I'm a freelancer. Yeah. Like, yeah. I had no money. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I had to, but they moved their office from Young. And oh, St. Clair no. to Brampton. <laughs> so I had to get my driver's license, mm-hmm. get yeah, a car, yeah. mm-hmm. uh, and then start driving out to Brampton every day. Anyway, it was fantastic. I was there for four years. I ran the development kitchen um, and learned so much about not just about 
food and, and, and product development, but also about the corporate world because mm. Loblaw, huge company, mm -hmm. yeah. right? yeah. thousands and hundreds of thousands of employees, hundreds and billions of dollars in, in, in money going through. So learning how the corporate world works, I think that was the best education I could have had was just getting that corporate mm -hmm. education. Mm -hmm. But you know, time you know, time moves on, and um, an opportunity came up because I was still writing at the, in my off hours, and an opportunity came up at House and Home magazine uh, to be their food editor. So again, this is just around this is two thousand eight, so just around the time when things were starting to explode, mm -hmm. but before there were like a million influencers and a million food experts. So I got the job. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, they took a chance on me, and I got the job. That's incredible. Yeah. That's awesome. And yeah. I walked in. So House and Home, like a high end decor <laughs> magazine. I I know nothing about magazines. I know nothing about <laughs> decor. I know I, I sort of show up, you know, like bright eyed, bushy tail. I never forget sitting at my first meeting where we were planning a shoot, a food shoot. Mm. I didn't, it was as if they were speaking another language. I didn't understand <laughs> what they said. I had nothing. So this is yeah. where I think my, my experience is the youngest child, uh, uh, of, is, which is just sit and listen. <laughs> and then run home and study and then come back the next day trying to feel smart again. Anyway, that was, so I was there for, um, I was, it was great. It was a beautiful job, fantastic. Just learned so much about the magazine business. It's a very small company run. It's privately held, so it's just... A very, very different. Probably like it's such a contrast from the car corporate world. Was going to say, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so, but then this job came up. The the job at Chatelaine came up. Mm. So, the, like the job, the reason I moved to Toronto, and the food <laughs> editor at Chatelaine, who'd been there for thirty years, who'd been a mentor of mine, mm -hmm. retired. And I was walking down the street with a good friend of mine, and I said, wow, I wonder who's going to get that job. What an amazing job it is. And my girlfriend said to me, why, why don't you apply for it? I said, oh, I'm not ready. Like, you know, and she sort of said, well, why, why wouldn't you just apply? Like, I think you're ready. Yeah. Anyways, uh, I got the job, <laughs> which was, uh, I guess I was ready. Uh, so I got the job, and I started at Chatelaine. So I had my dream job. I landed... Um, Two feet in, two mm -hmm. hands in, so delighted. Mm -hmm. An amazing job. Ran a test kitchen, had 10 staff, uh, you know, wow, running food incredible. shoots, liaising with editors, mm -hmm. uh, you know, new products being sent to you. Like, just the just the absolute best job. Editing recipes, right? Like, just so great. Mm -hmm. Loved it so much. And then it was through that that I, um, because uh, Chatelaine was owned by Rogers, and they also own City TV. So yep. through that job, I was asked to start going on City Line nice. TV mm -hmm. show. So they kind of bring you on. They're very cagey. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they're like, what are you going to do? Are you going to mess it up? And so you go on. And I didn't really, thank God, I didn't know this. You go mm -hmm. on, that's your audition, essentially. So I went on, did my thing, and then they started having me back twice a month. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Awesome. Yeah. Fantastic. So... <laughs> Just developing my public persona as well, and I have mm -hmm. always been. I mean, I have two degrees in theater and performance, so it's like never been came very, natural. Kind totally of right? came yeah, natural. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. you know, I no, weren't I, like camera shy or anything. Not at yeah. all. And and City Line's a great place. They just want you to be yourself. A mm -hmm. Wonderful place to just be very casual. Uh, they want you to be an expert, but also you know you, you drop something. It's like they're not going to stop the tape or anything. Mm -hmm. Like they mm -hmm. just they they love it all. So they love it all. So it was fantastic, and really felt a part of that family. Um, so then again, so then I'm back in the corporate world, right? Because the Chatelaine's owned by Rogers. This is yeah. a very long story. You asked for it. You're no, the, no, of course. Long we have lots of time. <laughs> That's, right. That's why we brought you. We're, we're interested in finding out, you know, every every little detail. I mean, yeah. Because yeah. I mean, obviously, you've had so much experience, you know. You know, and different uh, steps, and even though I'm only which, 21, which, it's crazy. <laughs> I was gonna say yeah. 20, but uh, sure, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I sometimes forget that I'm, I'm actually getting older every year. Oh, um, stop it! So, there I am in my dream job, like amazing, had an amazing boss. She had an amazing, like, just a fantastic creative space, mm. really doing exciting stuff in the magazine world, which. Granted, was starting to kind of crumble at the edges around it was 2010, so mm -hmm. by this time, like, digital is getting bigger and bigger every day, every second. Mm -hmm. uh, Twitter is happening, Facebook is happening. Um, things are changing really, really quickly. Um, and in the corporate world, quickly isn't something that they do, really, <laughs> right? So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I was there for six years. I had my son while I was there, and I was able to take a mat leave uh, for a year. Uh, and kind of like when I came back from my mat leave, I, things I could tell were like, you could tell things were starting to change a bit. My wonderful boss and mentor, left Chatelaine and went to Good Housekeeping in New York to become mm -hmm. the creative director of Hearst, like an absolutely massive job, mm -hmm. but it broke my heart, you know, like, because I missed her so much. Mm -hmm. 
new boss, didn't really see eye to eye, uh, and then new CEO of the whole company. And mm -hmm. anybody who's lived through the corporate Mm -hmm. CEO shuffle. I mean, I've now lived through <laughs> four or five of them. Yeah, it's yeah. the same pattern every time. New yep. CEO mm -hmm. comes in, big talk, big promises. You guys are the most important mm -hmm. asset mm -hmm. to this company. <laughs> la la la. Yeah, yeah. Then you know, six months later, they come in with the big plan, and um, it was in a, th a real throwaway mark. The new CEO, Rogers, you know, big splashy hire, um, like British guy, brought in like big, big, big splashy mm -hmm. hire. Known for tightening belts, known for the bottom line, like no surprise, corporations well, do this. That's right? what's been happening for really for the last yeah. ten years. Of you, you, you can yeah. notice like the pattern, really. And everybody yeah. expects there are going to be changes, there are going to be layoffs, there are going to be everything, whatever. So there's this big, like you know, the big town hall. They took, like it's Rogers, so they took the sky, they took over the Skydome, right? Because mm -hmm. they own yeah. the Skydome. Yeah. So when yeah. Yeah. Lenny Kravitz played, like it was big, big, big wow. Right? Yeah. Lenny so everybody's wow. like, wow. Yeah. <laughs> um, and <coughs> so in a throwaway mark remark, the CEO, like, you know, there's all this music and lights. And in this like throwaway remark, he happened to mention that the magazine division of Rogers contributed less than 1% to the bottom line. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. And like that was just a throwaway mark and he was moving on to other things and I'll never forget going, oh my God. That guy who's known for tightening belts, mm -hmm. who's known for the bottom line, who happens to mention that these incredible magazines, venerable, mm -hmm. historic, unique, you know, McLean, Chatelaine, yep. like Flair, mm -hmm. big, big brands contribute less than 1% to the bottom line. I thought, that's it, our days are numbered. Mm -hmm. um, and that was 2014, fall of 2014. And so I thought, I got to get out because I want to leave on my own terms. And I just knew from my role in the company, because, you know, identified as a rising star, mm -hmm. like all that bullshit, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I thought, they're just going to keep piling stuff onto me, and I'm going to be one of the last people here. Like, yeah. they're going to get rid of my, yep. I, could, I could just tell they're going to cut my staff, they're going to cut my budget, they're going to, mm -hmm. it's all going to go. Mm -hmm. So... But I didn't know what to do. Like there was no, as food director of Chatelaine, by that time I'd taken over six other brands at the company. Like I didn't know what to do. Mm -hmm. There was no natural next step up. Mm -hmm. uh, I could make a linear move, you know, like go to another magazine. I could try like maybe going into like back into the um, like consumer goods uh, mm -hmm. world, like Loblaws, Sobeys, like any of the grocery world. Um, I just didn't know. So I started having coffee with everybody who would have coffee with me. Uh, it was my year of coffee. I switched to decaf because I had so much coffee. Yeah. yeah. I used to live in Seattle, so I, 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 I know exactly what you're talking <laughs> at a about. At point, like, yeah. you got to have coffee. And you're like, oh, I don't decaf. So, and I just, I, like, true networking, I started just trying to figure out what was going on out there. What did the world look like? I'd been in a kind mm -hmm. of corporate bubble for six years. I needed to know what the world looked like. Mm -hmm. like. What are these? What are blogs? What are websites doing? <laughs> like, what's the future of social media? <laughs> Is it, people think it's all going to fizzle? So I started having coffees and coffees and coffees and coffees. And every time I had a coffee with somebody, I would say, well, do you think there's anybody else I should talk to? Can you think of anybody else mm -hmm. who would give me advice? Oh, mm -hmm. that's great network. I mean, right. that's, that's yeah. really, I mean... And that's true networking, yeah, and it yeah, wasn't like I was yeah. going to them saying, I need a job, get out of here, you got a job, because that's not yeah. networking, right? Like, that's well, yeah. not, of begging, course. that's yeah. bad. So yeah. it was truly just trying to figure it out, and I had this book, and I was taking all these notes, and I was meeting all these people, and sort of halfway or so about through that year, I realized, okay, well, I can either create a new job for myself in Rogers that mm -hmm. would take me, that keep me in the magazine world, but also get me into the corporate side so that my, my life, my career would be secure, mm -hmm. or I'm going to have to leave. Mm -hmm. So I did... I kind of started working on both ideas, so I pitched a great job for myself. Came up with a great job for myself that would be, I thought, beneficial to Rogers. Mm -hmm. That they would be, I would be the food director of the whole operation. Like that, ultimately, I would take on like all the cafeterias. That I would do everything that had anything to do with food mm -hmm. and would come through my department. They loved it. They're like, this is a, this is forward thinking. Like no one else is coming. Like oh, and you think mm -hmm. fantastic. Mm -hmm. And then the bottom fell out of everything. You know, the mm -hmm. main fi the main financial person who was totally on my side uh, was terminated. My boss was fired. Like walked out. Her boss quit. It, it was just like uh, sounds like a little bit of a mess. Yeah. Truly yeah. Enough, like mm -hmm. as I predicted, they kept putting all of this crap on me. All this stuff I had to do, mm -hmm. going on TV to sell stuff that I didn't believe in and. You know, you go and you can't like it's my face. Sure, it's your product. But it's my face. Like this is mm -hmm. my public profile. Mm -hmm. like, yeah. I've got to kind of guard that. It's sort of the only thing that. It's, I, funny I enough, it's, it's almost yeah. like taking you back, like uh, you know, all the way back to when you started working in the kitchens. Mm -hmm. And it's like you know, like what we discussed before the interview started. <laughs> 
how when you work in corporates restaurants you pretty much are you know a lot of the times you're just reheating a lot of the things right and you're That's like, right. putting it yeah. together in the pan and it becomes a monotonous kind of steady you know Progressive kind of job that's yeah. that's not really giving you a lot of creative outlet at all, yeah. right? So, yeah. so it's almost it like took you a full circle back to the exact yeah, same thing. I've never mm -hmm. thought of it. In that yeah, way. and that's true. Yeah. And uh, anyway, so the, my big plan to be like queen of the world fell apart. Um, things just got bad. Things got bad in the magazine world. Uh, um, and one day, it was I think it was the twenty sixth of mm -hmm. February, two thousand and sixteen. A memorable day. I couldn't actually walk into the building. I was so sort of distraught. Mm -hmm. I couldn't actually, and I, my very best friend in the world, she also worked there. And I had to call her and say, you got to have to come and get me. Like, I can't come into the building. She's like, oh, did you forget your pass card? Like, no, like, I actually can't. Like, <laughs> she, she was looking for the actual reason for why you couldn't make it. Yeah. So, and we sat together and she said, what are you doing? Like, because she mm -hmm. knew what I, what I've been hoping to do. <coughs> Mm -hmm. um, well, I gave my whatever. Mm -hmm. I gave my notice. Um, and my so you subconsciously is sort of new already, like that. that I knew, and yeah. it was one of those moments. And people have asked me this before. You're like, you're standing on the edge of the cliff, mm -hmm. and you're like, I'm mm -hmm. either gonna jump, or I'm not. Mm -hmm. And it's a really hard call to make. And anybody who's done like leaving a secure six-figure benefits job, my husband doesn't have mm -hmm. steady work. I mm -hmm. have a son. We bought a house. Mm -hmm. Like. Make deciding to make that leap, you've really got it. Like, but it's the, almost like the water is sort of like you know washing away at that. Exactly, you know, and little, the cliff is starting to feel really yeah, insecure. Yeah, yeah. And I finally, it was just like I finally just did it, mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, and left. And the great thing was that in that year of coffees, of course, I had a net to to jump into. Right, mm -hmm. I had amazing contacts and, and friends and uh, these, these amazing people who um, you know I think I only I reached out to a few of them and like within a couple of weeks I had a few little contracts you know, mm -hmm. a few little bits of work that I could mm -hmm. start doing and so that then I could build a website and like so then it was just like a tiny little snowball and it started mm -hmm. building a little bit mm -hmm. but I think you you almost started you know that progression way ahead of time because you know the fact that you started having those coffees to begin with right is because you already subconsciously knew that that's where it was sort of headed right because mm -hmm. and, then, and because of that i think that it was your obviously the drive that you've had as you know you even the progression that you've told us about so far i mean it's just seems incredible to go from you know such humble <laughs> beginnings to you know like you know growing as a person going back to school mm -hmm. getting, getting more education and just evolving and growing right so yeah. I, it, it doesn't hurt that so my my dad is in the career uh, business he's mm -hmm. been a job fit kind of expert for, and so I grew up in a world where it sounds so cliched and trite now but it was sort of part of our bread and butter like find something you love and you never work a day in your mm -hmm. life right? Mm -hmm. right so and my dad was always not just like you can do anything you want to do but like you can do exactly what you were designed to do Mm -hmm. um, and so my dad and I actually worked pretty closely as I tried to figure out what were the key values of who I am and where do I really get um, energy and joy from my work and satisfaction. Mm -hmm. So I, I knew there were a couple of pieces and one of them was independence. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, that's it. You know, I'm going to throw off the corporate <laughs> overlords and work for myself. And that was the, that was a big piece. In thinking, <coughs> no, I don't want to move to another corporation. I don't want to get into another office mm -hmm. um, environment most of it, I love talking to people I really wanted to work for myself mm -hmm. and then that would be that was three years ago uh, and at first I sort of thought I knew what I was what the work was that I was going to be going after like I was thinking for things like sponsored mm -hmm. blog posts mm -hmm. sponsored Instagram Facebook mm -hmm. posts mm -hmm. those sorts of things uh, recipe development for corporate clients um, I, I had spoken to City Line and they agreed to keep me on as an independent uh, you don't get paid for that, but it's fantastic for your profile. Yeah, the, expo the exposure alone, exactly. I mean, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So I thought, okay, well, this is what I'm going to do. And then, of course, in the first year, you, you end up trying all these different things um, and being, you know, phone rings. You're like, yeah, sure, I'll mm -hmm. do that job. Why not? What can, what can hurt? And then you, it starts to become clear. Like, you start carving away at the marble mm -hmm. and you start realizing what it is that you actually mm -hmm. want to do. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, sponsored posts, which are actually now pretty much dead. Instagram pretty much is, doesn't allow them almost anymore. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, Twitter is just a place for angry people. That, like, <laughs> yep. you know, so. <laughs> yeah. it, it's yeah. definitely evolved for sure. It's yeah. either angry people or yeah. people promoting something. So. Yeah, and yeah. Facebook is just kind of, you know, becoming starting to do a little bit, a lot more of a spot, uh, like censorship too from, from what we can tell. I mean, mind you, it's, you know, to some extent it kind of makes sense because there's just so much of it <laughs> out there. We don't really know what, what you know if it, it's actually true or not, mm-hmm. and and sure. I mean I, like I I can I can understand why they're doing it, but at the same time it kind of resonates of, you know like a little bit of, something that's the, you know that's sort of controlled in terms of like what media is essentially or mm-hmm. or was maybe in the last 20, 30 years mm-hmm. right, and it's almost kind of kind of becoming that a little bit too. It's, yeah. mm-hmm. And uh, probably out of necessity. Right? Yeah. Like mm-hmm. yeah. it's one thing to say oh yeah it's all free and open. Yeah. I remember when Instagram was just a chronological you know, feed, mm-hmm. it was just like, what has happened yeah. recently? Mm-hmm. And then it slowly changed into an algorithm. And you're like, oh, I'm seeing a post from three days ago and yeah. next yeah. to one from eight minutes ago. So all that stuff changes. And it's, you're exactly right. I mean, that's the way that media has always been. It's always been a curated collection Absolutely. of things. Yeah. And mm-hmm. here we are again. I think so much so, maybe, maybe even like, especially in the States, maybe in Canada it was a little bit different yeah. just because I think it was maybe a little bit more controlled by the government too, mm-hmm. to some extent. Mm-hmm. But it's, yeah. I mean, I don't know. It, it's 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 a long uh, conversation that we can, we can have yeah, probably for a, hours. Exactly. But let, let's not get into that. Let's, let's go back yeah. to um, yeah. to you. Um, I think so. Maybe you take us back. Uh, we don't want to go through maybe every single step in your career development, but at the same time, let's talk about some of the things that you maybe you've loved, you know, exploring and looking into right as well. So take us maybe go uh, you know a little step back from. Your progression from the restaurant world back into you know developing and working for yourself so you going back to you know doing cooking classes and stuff like that too mm-hmm. right because obviously that was sort of a push for you to try to evolve as a person mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. Um, and then that progression from there how did it take you I guess like what was sort of the the, the guiding thing behind you that sort mm-hmm. of took you to you know to progress to the, the you know the, the path that you took mm-hmm. because even even when you told us that you were offered the you know the high up position in the magazine, and you thought yourself that you weren't really ready. It's almost like mm-hmm. you, you're you know it's it's like <laughs> you you sort of knew that you wanted it and you you knew that you, you had to get it, but at the same time it's almost like at the back of your head you just knew you had to go for it, but <laughs> you sort of also were somewhat hesitant. But which I think is just comes natural with a lot of the you know human spirit and it's kind of Completely. it's it's one of those things that it's always in the back of your mind is like you know that little voice right that's look well can you do it right so it's like completely and again yeah. it's like the youngest of three kids you mm-hmm. know there's always somebody else always, always the little one right always the little yeah. one. someone else is always uh-huh. gets is in front of you someone else is always telling their story before you mm-hmm. um and I, I mean i think it's an issue for Entrepreneurs in general, women entrepreneurs in particular, mm-hmm. the issue of confidence and self-confidence and also then pitching yourself. So mm-hmm. it, everybody knows writing that cover letter is the hardest thing you do. Right? Oh, mm-hmm. Having yeah. to pitch yeah. yourself is just so hard and it's fine to write it down, but then to actually believe it and to then to, to actually then start a business on it. It's not a, like every day I sort of have to remind myself just a month ago, um, a contact of mine forwarded me a job description for a job that was open at the Toronto Public Library there. They were uh, they were posted a job to have the food, first ever food writer in residence program. Wow, okay. And uh, he said to me, he's one of my producers at the CBC, he said, have you seen this job opening? Like, I think you, know, mm-hmm. you should apply for it. And mm-hmm. I thought, and I had seen it, and I thought, oh, God, food writer in residence. Like, you've you got to be like 65 <laughs> to get that job. Like, there's no way that mm-hmm. I can get that job. I was offered the job yesterday. Wow, that's, <laughs> so, that's incredible. <laughs> yeah. So it's, I, was, I haven't really, I haven't really learned that. So you heard it here first. <laughs> but I was reading the job. Exclusive news, yeah. I yeah. passed it to my best friend, who's, uh, yeah. she's like, she runs her own business as well, and she's really, yeah, and yeah. she looked at, she said, it's like they thought of you and reverse wrote the job description <laughs> to describe you. And I thought, mm. really? Like, I don't know. She said, Claire, come on! <laughs> Anyways, so it's great. So I'm thrilled about that. So. That's yeah, fantastic. Yeah. That's great. Okay. Yeah. Um, but it's just to, to demonstrate that I, I still, <coughs> it's still not there, right? It's always a work in progress. No, I, I think that's, it's always like, you know, even going back to your, you know, experience working in the magazine world, I mean, that in itself is one of those things that's changed so much in the last 10 years, right? I mean, like, yeah. things are not what, like what like what they used to be right not and even going back to like television too now i mean i think that television still resonates with a lot of the you know 
the older generation, but the younger generation, they, they're all on YouTube, mm-hmm. Netflix, and everything else, right? Mm-hmm. So it's mm-hmm. so it's, it's not like they're they're tied to you know to cable or anything else, and it's no. not like they actually spend time really watching TV as much because because no, okay. everything's either on demand or you can just download everything. And it's just it's different, and I, that's when I think of myself as lucky for having landed in the corporate world when I did. Mm-hmm. Um, certainly as a rest in the restaurant world, you're always aware of the financial side. Like every I remember cutting a pepper, yep. you know, like mm-hmm. a red pepper on one of my first days of my apprenticeship and I instead of cutting it in like you can imagine mm-hmm. a pepper, instead of mm-hmm. cutting it in half and mm-hmm. then taking out the core, mm-hmm. I hope everybody understands <laughs> what I mean. I just lopped off the top and chucked the top into the bin. <laughs> and my master came down to me. He's like, what, what, are you, what, are you, what, are you, what are you, look at all that pepper that you're wasting. Do you yeah. know how much money we can make? And so, anyway, you learn from that, right? Yeah. So you yeah. learn, we, we made bread out of the scraps of old vegetables. Like, you, you make money off of stuff that other people might throw away. Oh, absolutely. And that's yeah. the only way you make money. I mean, in the restaurant world, the margins are this big. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I certainly had learned about the financial aspect and how critical it is when place where I apprenticed actually went out of business. No way. That's, mm-hmm. that's Probably crazy. because the owners were doing lines off of the dishwashing table. But that's oh, a different that, story. That, yeah, that, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> but that, that, that's just like a sort of the, you know, the world yeah. itself. It's, it's kind of, it can be sort of really dark and de- depressing yeah. in a lot of ways too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But then when I went into the corporate side, um, <coughs> I, I think it really trained me to always think about, um, for better or for worse, always thinking about the editorial, the kind of content as aligned with the sales stuff mm-hmm. because um, it's certainly in this day and age you cannot there is no pure content anymore mm-hmm. um, you know what you think about I've just actually finished reading the um, the memoir of Ruth Reichel who was the mm-hmm. editor-in-chief of mm-hmm. Gourmet yep. mm-hmm. and so she she took on that editorship in I think the late 90s roughly at a time like I said before it all exploded before it all happened when editorial was pure and and, and true mm-hmm. and never mm-hmm. touched by sales mm-hmm. by the time I was in the magazine world it was a critical piece because if your editorial didn't ha- satisfy your sales people you wouldn't have that sale and then you wouldn't have a magazine mm-hmm. so it became um, forever uh, an exercise in trying to figure out ways to keep your integrity and your authenticity as an editorial person as a content creator while um, making brands and clients happy and making sure the money was coming in and, mm-hmm. and it's a really fine balance right because you don't you don't want to be selling out of course. but at the same time you want a job and so it was an interesting time from the time I was in magazines from 2008 until 2016 to just see how that evolved and then later on in the time in my time um, <coughs> at the magazine it the, it became very skewed. So suddenly mm. it was like, instead of editorial and sales being kind of balanced with each other, it became much more heavily weighted to sales. And if uh-huh. there was a product that mm. a sales company wanted in your magazine, you did whatever it took. Mm-hmm. You sold yourself out, you, whatever. Like, right. And mm-hmm. so it's been interesting to see how that has happened. And it's the same on TV. Now, you know, uh, food brands call me and they say, oh, we'd love to be a part of your next Cityland segment. I said, well, you, it doesn't. That doesn't matter. I can't uh-huh. just come on and say, "Oh, I love using this water." Right. Yeah. No, no. You have to have buy-in from the company. Oh, of course. Yeah. 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 So, and that's because they all want to cut out of the deal. You know, of yeah, course, exactly. they don't want me yeah. making yeah. a couple hundred bucks when they could be making. Who, who's a million. this girl? She just yeah. showed up and just promoted <laughs> right, this brand. Yeah, She's right. like, well, "Where's our yeah. cuts?" Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. So it's been interesting to kind of see that shift, but I think I have been. Um, <laughs> uniquely positioned or whatever mm-hmm. my background is that brought me to the point that I accept that and I would like to work within those parameters as best mm-hmm. as I can because mm-hmm. like if, if I tried to say oh no I absolutely like mm-hmm. you, can't, you just can't like you've got to have some give and take right now in the media world because you can't you, like there is no pure journalism anymore or if there mm-hmm. is, oh there, there's dying. an I agree yeah 100% mm-hmm. <clears throat> it's um, not being funded yeah mm-hmm. and I, I think that's um, especially with you know the, with working for yourself there's always that's question that comes into play is like you know where's that line that you that you draw uh, definitely. But like how much do you uh, are you willing to go in order to you know give way on the things that you kind of find maybe you know Facebook. wholly to some extent mm-hmm. or you know to, yeah. to yourself and then like you know like where's that line like where do you draw that and that's it and yeah. that's and i've i've known from the beginning that like i said one of my issues when i was at, at in, in the rogers family was 
I was being asked to sell things on TV that I didn't believe in, mm-hmm. and it's my face, it's my face mm. and my name. So it's almost like you were like like the shopping channel a little bit, right? <laughs> I did the shopping channel. I okay. Was to do the shopping really? Channel. Oh, oh my goodness. On my birthday, I was oh, really about that. Anyway, that's a different story. I don't want to talk about it. This is yeah. water under the bridge. But I, but in, when I started my own business, I knew I had lists at the beginning of brands I would love to work with, and mm-hmm. there were a very short list of brands I would never work with mm-hmm. because they didn't fit into who I am as a brand and. My, my, I know my, my brand identity. <laughs> it's so funny to speak about yourself as a brand, but you kind of have to think it about is. it. It is. I mean, it's, it, that's yeah. how it's become nowadays. Right. It's just, everything's <laughs> online. Everything's present. Yeah. Your life is seen, especially, and then if you want to push yourself, if you want to appeal to the consumer, mm-hmm. or if you want to appeal to those brands, you almost have to give away a little bit of that private life, right? So and you it's, do, and, and I am the brand. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm not starting, I'm not an entrepreneur starting a company, like I am my brand, and yeah, so absolutely. I have really, a, a really strict uh, list of sort of, it's actually adjectives that I just lean on. I have six adjectives that I lean on, and when a client comes to me with something, with a, a an opportunity, a job uh-huh. they would like me to do. I think back to my six adjectives. Is this who I am? Does this fit who I am? And in five years, what will this say about me if I do this big campaign for X, Y, Z product? What will it say in 10 years? And does that this get me to where I want to be in 25 years? Mm-hmm. So I'm always, I always want to think about the long goal. Mm-hmm. Um, because I really like that about you because it's almost like you strategize. And even from, mm-hmm. from, from everything you were telling me from the beginning, it's almost <laughs> like you already had it sort of planned out yeah. in your head yeah. Yeah, yeah. Totally. of where you were going, right? Like, so remember the old, yeah. like when we were first talking about uh, <laughs> recycling and stuff, it was uh, act locally, think globally. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I want my day-to-day life to be happy and balanced mm-hmm. and joyful, mm-hmm. but at the same time, I want to be planting seeds every day so that in 25 years, I am where I want to be mm-hmm. as well. And it, it, it's not retired on a yacht, by the way. Like <laughs> I want to work every day of my life. Yeah. I, I love my work, and I want mm-hmm. to keep working, so it's not as if I'm pushing for retirement. I think that's something that like a lot of <laughs> entrepreneurs in this day and age, especially like with Instagram, struggle with. Because they all want like the short term, you know, it's to reach it. those goals so that they can, you know, show off in front of other people, and you know, it, it's it's like they're not like strategizing for, you know, the work that's still going to be involved twenty, thirty years from now. Well, and that's and it. then they don't want to even put in that work because you know business is hard, and then they get impatient, right? And it's hard to turn down, say, you know, two hundred and fifty bucks for something. Yeah. But I mm-hmm. do it all the time because it doesn't get me to that like two hundred fifty mm-hmm. bucks. Sure, yeah, that but it's, it's money, right? Mm-hmm. But, if that does something detrimental to my brand, takes me in a different direction, mm-hmm. it doesn't. It doesn't matter. You know that two hundred fifty bucks doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. Um, it, so it's and I talk to to young bloggers about this a lot. That it's that is one of the hardest decisions you'll ever have to make is saying no to money mm-hmm. um, if it doesn't actually feed the brand. Mm-hmm. So you're either doing it. I always say you're either doing it because. Um, it's good for where you want to go. It's good for you right now. Mm-hmm. Um, it gets you into the world that you want to be into, or they're paying you a fuckload of money. Like <laughs> this is so, and that's yeah. what that became yeah. a thing for yeah. me. So yeah. if a brand would come to me and say, like a brand came to me in my first year and said they wanted me to go and do the shopping channel and do an, one of their appliances, mm-hmm. and I thought, okay, this I. I'm really not, appliances are not my thing. So like Instant Pot, great. You love it, go mm-hmm. for it. Slow mm-hmm. cooker, great. You love mm-hmm. it, fantastic. Mm-hmm. You go for it. Vitamix, but you're never, It's ne- that's never going to be my lead. I'm mm-hmm. never going to say you need to have a stand mixer to make this. Ne- this. So, that's, <laughs> I, so I knew right away, appliances, not really my jam. Mm-hmm. So I quoted them crazy high. Like I quoted them like $25,000 for, I can't even remember what it was. And then it was, I thought, well, if they, if they say yes, <laughs> yeah, good for you. Know, you. Yeah, 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 sure. Uh, yeah. And I'll make do, and I'll fit. Like it's not a total, it's not a total miss for me. And I mm-hmm. can make do with it, but mm-hmm. it's a great payday, which will then allow me to do a bunch of other stuff for free or for low money. Mm-hmm. Um, or they come back and say, "Oh, I'm so sorry, that's too much for us," which is ultimately what they did. So mm-hmm. it was great. Maintain a great relationship. <laughs> they think I'm super expensive, uh, which is good. Um, and then I didn't end up having to work for that client. Yeah. So. It was all good in the end, mm. but that became a kind of a trick that I use. And if it's something like I actually have to think about myself going in uh, to because as a freelancer, you're asked to quote on jobs all the time. It's not like I have a set of rates. I'm uh, everybody wants a custom quote, which is fine. I have to imagine myself driving to the shopping network. I know exactly what's entailed. Spending the entire day on national television mm-hmm. promoting this thing. Mm-hmm. 
How would that feel? Well, if I was doing it for $1,000, it would feel pretty crappy. But if mm-hmm. I was doing it for $25,000, I think I could get behind it. Mm-hmm. I mean, I know that sounds like mercenary and kind of crass, but <laughs> like... It's, it's not, though, because mm-hmm. it's, you know, it's it's your personal brand. And I think that it's it's almost like you're investing in yourself, right? If, if they're willing to put up that sort of money, <coughs> you can take that money back and, and reinvest it back into your brand mm-hmm. and to develop it and grow it, you know, so much more. So it is a sort of a small sacrifice that you're making. Yeah, in order as a for, creative yeah, person, right. as a magazine mm-hmm. person, yeah. having that background and like that whole editorial mm-hmm. sales thing, mm-hmm. I can make any, I can, I, I can. Oh, I bet. I, you I can, can yeah. give me mm-hmm. some stupid, crazy appliance that's like too big <laughs> that nobody should have it and I can still figure out a way to sell it to you. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. yeah, so, but anyways, it's, just been you know now year now three years in i'm pretty clear on what brands i would love to work with and what brands i don't want to work mm-hmm. with mm-hmm. um and i sort of have a really good system my own personal system for figuring out if it's a yes or no like if if you come to that point I'm like oh should i do it should i not do it i sort of have a good mm-hmm. internal system for figuring that out i love mm-hmm. how you have uh, you know this kind of kind of outlook on life of not really retiring <laughs> I, just, I, I just keep working. Be, 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 yeah. Well, I think yeah. that it's it's important. I think that uh, that's what a lot of people are sort of missing too, is because they always have that goal in mind. It's like, yeah, you know, I, I want to make this much money, and then I just want to retire and, and you know, yeah, and, and go like live a, on a yacht somewhere, right? And like just mm. drink yeah. champagne every day, and that's sounds great. Yeah, I mean, you I do it for a year, and then oh, you, you, I was you, gonna you say just, week, but yeah. <laughs> Well, I, I'm thinking from for younger generation, they probably get a lot, you know, yeah. t- take them a lot longer to, to get bored. Uh, yeah. I'm just, you know, exaggerating, obviously, yeah. a little bit. Mm-hmm. But I, I think that's one of the things is, is that a lot of pe- people are sort of missing is you kind of have to always stimulate your mind to, to, to kind of grow, and, and, right? And, and there are different personalities, yeah, right? Yeah, no, for and, sure. And I say that as well, like, it's not everybody who should be a freelancer. And, and I, make I it, agree like, 100%. Like, you have to, like, I have mm-hmm. to hustle. I have to wake up every day and hustle. Like, mm-hmm. I, you know, mm-hmm. I, the rest of my day today is meetings with potential, maybe, potential, maybe, potential. Mm-hmm. It's, talk, it's all about planting seeds for the future. Mm-hmm. Um, and, I, you know, i got to go out there and i got to pitch myself and i got to be nice and I've got to re- research that brand. And I actually have my theme for the year. My, my, you know, every year I sort of pick a theme for myself. And this year, don't be lazy because, mm. like, you cannot, like, you do. I love that. You know, you just cannot. Mm-hmm. I actually have a cross stitch on a little thing in my office. Well, don't be lazy. Um, it, it's. I love to work. I love to work hard, especially on something that I enjoy. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's nobody like I'm not doing an office. You know, I'm not. Yeah. I don't have a. I don't have a somebody working at my schedule for the day. Mm-hmm. So if you're not if you're not willing to work hard and truly hustle every day, I don't think that you should become a freelancer. You just I, shouldn't. I agree 100 percent because I think a lot of people are just they're they're happy at those jobs, right? I mean, mm-hmm. I'll, 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 yeah, I'll, and I'll, I'll, there's nothing yeah. wrong with it. I don't think the, 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 you know. not at yeah. all. Yeah. Thank God, mm-hmm. because the world needs every type of person. Of course, like somebody's got to be making my coffee. Oh, Absolutely, yeah. People yeah. who work at Starbucks seem pretty happy. Anyway, well, I, I think a lot of them probably have master's degrees too, which they is which is really yeah. really sad to be yeah. honest. With, but, yeah. Yeah, but yeah, that's you know, kind of the reality happy. nowadays. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but the, the the idea of like <coughs> I worked out with a woman, and last week she's about maybe fifty six. She retired. She's fifty six. She retired. She worked in the she worked in the police services for thirty years, mm-hmm. and she was retired. And I thought, you know, she's you know we're both bench pressing the same amount. I like, <laughs> like what's she gonna do? I said, well, what are you gonna do now? Mm-hmm. And she said, oh, all the things I never got to do when I was working. Um, and I think I'm grateful that all the things that I do in my work are the things I want to do. Mm-hmm. And there's like, it's not like oh I wish I could write a novel. Well, you know what? I, I can factor that into my day if I want to. Like, oh, you know, I wish I could travel the world. I don't really. I mean, I've traveled a lot. I've yeah. been really mm-hmm. great, lucky, lucky and grateful to have traveled a lot. I continue to travel. Mm-hmm. If that's what I want to invest in, that's mm-hmm. what I will invest in. Mm-hmm. Do I want a fancy car? No. Do I want a bigger house? No. Mm-hmm. You, you know, like, I, I'm, I feel like I have created a daily life for myself, which mm-hmm. is very satisfying. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so that allows me to keep thinking about the future. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Talk a little bit about, about travel and has it mm-hmm. allowed you to sort of grow as a, you know, a food writer or somebody who mm-hmm. does, you know, recipe development? Because because I think that it, it plays a huge role in any like in, any person's really development in, in, in so many so ways. Right. It, but so much so maybe even like with food. Right. Because yeah. it can I mean, like going to Italy or like going to China, yeah. it, it could yeah. have such I mean, the world has become so small, it seems like, but because mm-hmm. it's, everything is so globalized, and you can go to like you know, in Toronto, and you can find like the most authentic 
specialty niche you know cuisine from china from somewhere right mm. and like you could probably be you know just as good as you know back home yeah. if not better sometimes right mm. it's uh, it's really interesting that you brought that up because i was thinking the other day we had a, my husband and i we love to entertain we had a dinner party we just had a couple of couples over and one of them is sort of a new a new newish friends so uh -huh. we were introduced uh -huh. them to another couple and i thought why do they get along with these guys so well and i thought it's because they travel. It's mm -hmm. because they have traveled. Mm -hmm. And not in the sense that we can say, oh, have you been to Florida? Yeah. I've been to Florida. Yeah. No. Yeah. So my husband's English. He moved to Toronto, to Canada 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. He worked all over the world, Amsterdam, Cape Town. Cape nice. Like, he worked mm -hmm. all over the world. I had an extraordinary, like, the formative experience of my life. When I was 10, my dad was posted to Kathmandu, Nepal. Wow, okay. I lived there for three years. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. Third poorest country in the world. Yep. Mm -hmm. Like, Completely changed the whole it's, trajectory it's, it's of my life. It's such a different right? world. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. and, but it yeah. also, like, it just, <coughs> the thing about travel is, it actually, it, it does two things. It opens your mind, but it also makes you self-aware. Mm -hmm. And you know, you can tell people who haven't traveled, nothing against it. it it's absolutely fine. Mm -hmm. I don't care. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. it's a very different outlook on life. And it's, there's a very, there's a different kind of ease um, and you talk about going to, you know, you're in, we live in Toronto, you can go and find some dumpling that's only made in one yeah. village in China, but it's exactly. also made here. Exactly. And people who haven't traveled have no interest mm -hmm. in going mm -hmm. to outer Scarborough to mm -hmm. find that weird. But people who have traveled, it's no thought, to, oh yeah, you know, we're going to have to take yeah. the subway and three buses, whatever, no mm -hmm. problem. And I, I, I think that having traveled so young, having traveled so like deep into a place where there are was like nothing mm -hmm. and then because we were going back and forth to Nepal for three years you know I've been all over Malaysia Southeast Asia all over Europe and I still like I think nothing of back in the suitcase I mean, my my parents are going to Italy so I'm like I'll come with you okay great <laughs> great so package mm -hmm. carry on like no problem my brother and sister are going to come with us as well because it's it's just makes it very easy mm -hmm. um and I think that there's a you know, when you, when you travel, you have to be humble, right? You have to ask somebody where the bathroom is mm -hmm. in a language mm -hmm. that you don't speak. Mm -hmm. um, and so you have to have that humility. And you, and, and also, you sit, you're going to sit down at a restaurant, and you're going to eat something that is unfamiliar to you. Mm -hmm. um, maybe you're going to like it. Maybe it's going to be bad. <laughs> but there's just Tourist trap, yeah. Exactly, right? So you just have to be <laughs> yeah. open. Yeah. And I think that makes a huge difference in your outlook on life. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, in the food world, because when you travel the food is just different right mm, like no you kidding go, and I know, when you yeah. go and make that effort to find the place the last time i was in, in italy it was 10 years ago um but the mad cow situation it was still hanging mm -hmm. over europe mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and but there were a few little places in rome where you could still get um intestines mm -hmm. and there's a very particular roman dish it's the it, and it's particular type of intestines. Mm -hmm. I'm not an Anthony Bourdain, like I love guts, <laughs> but this particular dish, I thought, this dish is dying. Like, mm -hmm, this mm -hmm. is going to be gone. And if I can find this little place, it's only open on Thursdays. And I mm -hmm. went on a special trip and I had it. And now like, I've had that and I've tasted mm -hmm. that. It was very weird. Um, but it was so <laughs> unique, yeah. right? So to have that kind of experience then can inform everything else we do. I'm mm -hmm. kidding, I know. Yeah. And I, I, I think that's going back to what you, you mentioned, one of those words, <laughs> self-awareness. And I think that's, mm -hmm. It, it totally just, you know, opens up your perspective on life in a completely different, you know, light. It's, you you just, you notice things in a, in a different mm -hmm. way. You see things in a different way. And it's just, it allows you to almost have like an outsider's perspective mm -hmm. on things, right? Mm -hmm. So, and mm -hmm. when you bring that back to, to Canada, I think mm -hmm. that it allows you to evolve too. And I think, yeah, I mean, we're, we're like, especially Toronto, like we're a super multicultural city. But when you go, you know, outside of that to like urban areas in Canada, it's not like that at all. It's, not. it's such a big contrast, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. there's nothing wrong with that. It's just that it's, it's like it's two completely different worlds. And it's always like, you know, it's it's always some sort of a little bit of a tension mm -hmm. in between the two. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily maybe in a negative way. It's just the way things are. It's just, you know, mm -hmm. it's just the way life is, right? So, mm -hmm. but I, I think that we de definitely have, you know, the opportunity to kind of experience a lot of different cultures especially you know in toronto and with, i think that a lot of people are just kind of taking it for granted I, yeah, yeah. But I, like i, I, I love mm, toronto yeah. i'm not that i like i go to zero theater mm -hmm. i don't eat out very mm -hmm. much but i still love that i live in the city like i live downtown yeah. uh you know my kid he's growing up eating crazy food, you know, other kids are bringing stuff to lunch, it's like, who knows what, like, it's, 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 that's all very normal for him, and I would love, I mean, I would love to give to him what I had as a kid, which was being forced to go and live somewhere 
essentially off the grid. It doesn't mm. really exist anymore. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so I think growing up in Toronto and being dragged. You can probably find some tribe somewhere in South America. Yeah, probably could. They might take an in. Send them off for the good. summer. Speak French, you know? Well, know perfect, yeah. yeah. Um, I'll learn a new language in no yeah. time, I'm sure. Before dragging them around to crazy markets and, you yeah. know, he, like, so at least... Just imagine he's watching this, like, 15 years down the road, right, on, yeah. on YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mom. Mom, you know, <laughs> roll his eyes. Yeah. yeah. Inevitably, you know, you're having another dinner party. <laughs> <laughs> No, that's that's crazy. Um, uh, t tell us a little bit more about <laughs> how you feel. Uh, you know, the magazine world is evolving, and mm -hmm. if it's evolving at all, or if it has the opportunity to to evolve, so, and like yeah. with, with all the development with with food bloggers, and you know that becoming sort of the thing now. But at the same time, it's just it feels like it's so overly saturated mm -hmm. yeah. in a lot of ways, and I think that's with with that you know a lot of. Not so good. Maybe bloggers kind of come on board too, well, and a lot of stuff too. I yeah. feel like the era of the blogger has it ended about two or three years ago. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. anybody who wasn't established at that time in the food world, anybody sure. who wasn't established at that time is not. You're not getting into the game anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and it might even have been earlier than that. But um, I'm part of a group. Um, although I'm not, I don't consider myself a blogger. I am mm -hmm. part of a group of food bloggers in Canada, mm -hmm. um, and there are a few sort of. But, you know, there are a handful of people who really get a lot of traffic, who do a lot of business, who still in that old model, which is having ads on your site, doing sponsored posts, mm -hmm. um, that they're still making money in that way. Mm -hmm. Anybody else who's coming into the game now, it's over. Like, to your point, it's yeah. first of all super saturated, and second of all, the market has changed. Like, sponsored posts don't really happen mm -hmm. anymore. Mm -hmm. Yes, sponsored posts on Instagram happen a little bit if you've got... Like, I'm talking a million followers. You know, 10,000 mm -hmm. used to be the baseline. Now it's like, you've got to be huge. Um, and Instagram is very tight on what they allow you to do. So the model has changed in terms of how you can make money as a food blogger. So if you thought, okay, well, I'm going to start a blog. I'm going to throw Google ads on my, <laughs> on my site. And I'm going to do some sponsored posts. Mm. Um, I don't think you're making any money anymore. Yeah. Um, and if, if you're sort of wedged in there and that's all you want to do and that's all you can do, you're in trouble mm -hmm. um, because you need to evolve with the market, right? You mm -hmm. just have to. And that's of course, one of the of things course, I yeah. love about being a freelancer is I can evolve. So having been in the corporate world, and I mentioned this right off the top, that the corporate world is slow, right? Like oh, it doesn't, uh, yeah. one of my bosses used to say, it's like trying to turn the Queen Mary. Like you can't <laughs> just, you can't just. It's a great analogy. Right? Like that. you can't just make yeah. a decision. Mm -hmm. It's got to be pitched and then, and then strategic mm -hmm. and then this and then roll out. And then, so. Mm -hmm. It's a year before anything happens. As a freelancer, if you call me up and you want rest a recipe for some crazy new product and you're in a huge rush and you need it by like Thursday, mm -hmm. I can do it, right? Mm -hmm. if, mm -hmm. if I have the time on my schedule, right? Mm -hmm. Sure, I can try. You, you know, CBC calls me up. They want me to come and talk about a certain time. I can drop everything and go there. So you know, it's a really, it's a nimbleness that um, I love and that the market loves as well, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. it just means that clients who know that they can come to you and you can come up with a plan with them and, and execute it within a short period of time, they love that mm -hmm. because that's the speed mm -hmm. that we live at now. Oh, right? no, no kidding, especially in North yeah. America. I mean, that's... Completely, yeah, that's... completely. Uh, you know, from pop-up restaurants that exist for a week yeah. to, you know, or just for a night mm -hmm. uh, to some, I mean, you know, how often have you, like, opened up the in internet and you're like, oh, my God, everybody's involved in, and it's three days old, and you're like, oh, my God, it's three days old, I'm so... <laughs> <laughs> oh my right. god, yeah. it was trending three days ago. <laughs> I'm, too I'm too late. <laughs> I haven't done a review about that yet. So. Yeah. Oh, what's the yeah. thing? Yeah. And in the magazine world, we were certainly, <coughs> like magazines, newspapers and magazines were, were, were where the trends always happened, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, and then as magazines, smart magazines really embraced digital, then it became... Uh, relatively seamless. The only issue that wasn't seamless was that whereas in a magazine, in a print magazine that had six million subscribers, um, you know, a big full page ad cost a, uh, mm -hmm. a company a lot of money. Okay, great yeah, revenue. Of so digital ads don't cost the same. No, um, they don't. Of they don't last as long. Yeah. And so it's just, a, like I said, it's, it's a, a numbers model. game too mm -hmm. for them, right? So Completely. yeah. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so and as the books, as the magazines get smaller, then the subscribers go down, then the ads get smaller, and the rates get lower. So mm -hmm. it's just like a shit, it's like serving champagne on a waterbed, right? Mm -hmm. Like you just <laughs> never really know what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And some magazine companies have really been able to kind of 
go with that and capitalize on that and identify a market and go with it. I think of Bon Appetit in the U.S. <laughs> who really, you know, when Gourmet closed and Condé Nast said they were putting all their money into Bon Appetit, this is like 2008 or so, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. everybody in the food world thought, that's such a mistake, Bon Appetit is such a disaster. And they had a weird year of like trying stuff out. And then it was like they figured out who their audience was and they delivered and they delivered and they are still delivering. And now they've got books and websites mm-hmm. and video series and podcasts and shoot offs and like and they've been so successful. Multi platform, mm-hmm. all based on the print magazine, but multi platform, mm-hmm. very successful. Mm-hmm. So I think that takes some upfront investment and it takes a really smart person at the top. Mm-hmm. A lot of, uh, you know, trying and testing and... Yeah, but also yeah. really institutional knowledge and being smart mm-hmm. about it in a magazine, not just saying, okay, we're going to get rid of all these people who are experienced and hiring a bunch of new interns who don't mm-hmm. know anything and who cost mm-hmm. a fraction. So not doing that. Now, the thing about the magazine world in Canada is because Canada is so small... I was going to say, I was, yeah. I was actually... That, I was leading into that question so, exactly. Like, yeah. it's such yeah. a small market. Yeah. And, and whereas... You know, in its heyday, <coughs> Chatelaine had 6 million readers. Like, Good Housekeeping has 60 million readers mm-hmm. in the U.S. Like, mm-hmm. that, that uh, you know, you sell one magazine here, you sell all the middle. Like, it's just very, yeah. very different. Mm-hmm. But, of course, because of the digital world, Chatelaine is no longer competing just with, like, another Canadian magazine. Like, mm-hmm. Chatelaine mm-hmm. and Canadian Living used to yeah. be the old. Yeah. Now Chatelaine is competing with every magazine, every platform, mm-hmm. every blogger, mm-hmm. every Instagram. Mm-hmm. And that is a very different kind of pond to swim in. Oh, no kidding. And without, I think, a really brilliant person at the top, it's just really, really hard. So mm-hmm. two weeks ago, Rogers sold all of his magazines. Mm-hmm. And they were, we knew that they were, they, we knew they were on the, I knew it was going to happen, less than 1% mm-hmm. of the bottom line, even though that CEO is long gone. Like, yeah. mm-hmm. still, yeah. he's still not a big contributor to the profit. So, <laughs> um, and everybody, we knew it was on the table. It was trying, they were trying to sell all the magazines. Um, and it, best possible outcome, they were bought by another publishing company. So mm-hmm. they were bought by St. Joseph's. And that feels like, I don't know for sure, I'm not involved. Uh, it feels like there's going to be an investment into those amazing brands mm-hmm. and to mm-hmm. give them a bit of... You Do know, you feel like they're, they're going to get sort of consolidated a little bit, though? Like, it'd be because of... They were already pretty tight. Like, yeah, They yeah, were yeah, sharing enough. one copy editor mm-hmm. among, like, six magazines. Like, oh, <laughs> like, shit, that, you know? that's, yeah. that, that's brutal. <laughs> yeah. oh, so my goodness. it's already pretty... I think it was about as lean. Like, mm-hmm. when I left Sh- the day I left Shadowing, I think it had 45 employees and... Mm-hmm. Yesterday had how, how do you feel like they I mean like going back to what you were saying like they have to compete against <coughs> you know, even smaller bloggers or smaller channels mm-hmm. that are out there right mm-hmm. like wh- what is the the next step that they can you know grow into like what is it that they can mm-hmm. actually well, get into I mean because mm-hmm. it, it seems like video is becoming sort of the thing now right mm-hmm. it's it's like like what like where like because market is so saturated like how do they you know how do different brands kind of make themselves stand out and like i've seen that with something like epicurious right mm-hmm. they're doing a lot more stuff on youtube and like they're doing a lot more videos mm-hmm. with you know celebrity chefs and like you look at somebody like um um uh what's the, what's the big publication like vice right like the mm-hmm. their 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 food offshoot right uh and what they're trying to do like with doing like specialty series so for example like i know like there's there's one chef from new york that they took who specializes in pizza and they they took him all around the world right yeah uh, trying out different types of pizzas and like mm-hmm. getting him like you know his opinion on that, that kind mm-hmm. of stuff so it's almost like they're trying to take the anthony bourdain kind of idea and like spin it off a little bit mm-hmm. yeah. but it, it seems like people are becoming lazier and lazier it's it's, it's almost <laughs> like it's like why i read yeah. or like i just turn this you know youtube yeah. channel on and just turn off my mind and kind of you know yeah. while i'm having my dinner i can just watch this pizza show or you know yeah. something yeah. like that it's, because it, it's one thing for you know like magazines like chatelaine to evolve like with the market like as you said um but like considering like there's like foodies and, and this people's art art mentioned like with big channels on youtube you know they're also evolving with the market, and mm-hmm. if uh, if their if their way of getting like the message across to you know their followers through video form is easier than through reading, mm-hmm. then then what are like you know magazines such as Chatelaine doing to mm-hmm. you know stay relevant and have people still want to read them as opposed to you know watching videos from like anyone else that's yeah. you know yeah. that's that's doing it more I guess in the modern way. Yeah, I mean I can't I can't speak to what they're doing, but that mm-hmm. I know that it's something that. I think about uh, as a freelancer, and I when I read a lot about business and about being a freelancer, I I take comfort in the idea that you don't actually need a hundred million followers. Mm-hmm. Like if you have a thousand Absolutely. true followers, mm-hmm. it's this old Seth Godin line that if you have a mm-hmm. hundred 
to, well, let's call them 100 super fans, 1,000 true followers, mm -hmm. people who will actually buy your book, watch your video, <coughs> um, you're kind of all right. Like, mm -hmm. that's as, and, and so instead of thinking, okay, what can I make? What kind of cookbook can I make that will appeal to a million people? Mm -hmm. No, what kind of cookbook can I make that will appeal to my 102 fans mm -hmm. and my 1,000 real followers? Mm -hmm. um, and then ultimately, that for me meant, so when I made my book, <coughs> what, what can I do to make me happy? <coughs> and, mm -hmm. at, and so I started, like I said, I take comfort in that in, because if you're constantly trying to please everybody, mm -hmm. it's impossible. Yeah. Like, like the world is so full of different people. Some mm -hmm. people want to watch a cannabis cooking show on mm -hmm. Vice. Some people want to yeah. watch MasterChef, mm -hmm. Extraordinary mm -hmm. Junior. Mm -hmm. Some mm -hmm. people don't even give a fuck about any food. They mm -hmm. would just, if you could just give them a pill and that would make them happy yep. and mm -hmm. satisfied, mm -hmm. that's what they would do. So mm -hmm. uh, instead of trying to make something for everyone, just try to make something um, for myself and for my real, for my my own type, mm -hmm. my, my group, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that, I think that that sort of leads us into, um, I guess the you know everybody's. I'm talking about most likely just North America in, in this case, but you know everyone's relationship with food that we have here. It's mm -hmm. right. Um, this is going back to you know the convenience aspect of it, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's almost like. Uh, I'm just speaking from my own experience. I I have probably at least maybe 200 different cookbooks mm -hmm. myself because I. I just love cooking and that's kind of my passion too and that's always kind of been um having a little bit of you know background in that too and like some experience i think that's it's always for, for at least for me what it, it is sort of finding something unique in every single book mm -hmm. that sort of stands out from from the rest of them right mm -hmm. it's like how many like you know italian cookbooks can you have how many like chinese cookbooks can you have mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. how many you know thai food cook, food books can you have because a lot of them are very similar and they a lot of them replicate sort of you know along the lines of what what they offer so <coughs> tell us more about your book and like your inspiration behind it mm -hmm. how did you come up with the recipes that you did i mean obviously you need to have to somewhat resonate with you right mm -hmm. and that you know it's something that probably you would probably cook on an regular basis a lot right so or I something cook that, every night yeah like, mm -hmm. I, that's that's mm -hmm. my jam like i cook every night we sit down and have dinner every night of the week mm -hmm. um and i mean i wrote the book so what i knew i wanted to write a book i knew the book was going to be an important piece of my business plan mm -hmm. i know i mm -hmm. mentioned that mm -hmm. earlier that um so in canada you don't get into the book business to make any money in fact please invest in it because you're not going to make any money you might be as i am in a hole currently mm -hmm. um but it's like making an expensive, beautiful business card. This right. is the proof of who I am and what mm -hmm. I do. Mm -hmm. And I knew that, and so I knew it, it really had to capture exactly what my brand was. So mm -hmm. very, in that sense, easy for me. Mm -hmm. um, when I figured out what I wanted the book to be, and we've settled on the, the, the title. So I'll just take you back to how it came about. So it was that first year when I was in business and I kept thinking, okay, I'm gonna write a book, I'm gonna write a book, I'm gonna write a book. Um, but first, you know, I'm going to develop an online course, <coughs> my website, and I'm going to increase my this. I'm going to try some video stuff. And then a girlfriend of mine said to me, she's in the publishing business in uh, fiction. She's a fiction writer, mm -hmm. a successful fiction writer. And she said, um, when are you going to write your book? And I said, oh, you know, I'm thinking maybe after September I might have. And she said, oh, okay, well, do you know, well, like, you're going to publish it yourself? Are you going to go with a traditional publisher? I said, mm -hmm. oh, well, you know, Penguin, the publisher of Penguin, mm -hmm. is, is sort of after me to write something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And she said, well, the publisher uh, of Penguin wants a book <laughs> and she said you pick up your phone right now and you know that you, you're going to date to meet her and to pitch her a book and I was like, what? she's like that happens to nobody no, yeah. nobody mm. nobody so I, <laughs> so I, I, called, I called her I said can I meet you it was the middle of June I said can I meet you in the middle of July for lunch I have a book idea for you at that time I did not have a book <laughs> it's, it's, it's almost like going back to, to, to that the experience that you were telling me when you showed up you didn't know anything you're like let's go home and study up you right. show up in the morning you be like yeah like I, I know how to do this yeah. I was a true journalist I only ever I'm just kidding of course no, yeah. no 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 but at the same time you, you've obviously had a lot of experience with, yeah. with yeah. developing so, of, of recipes yeah, like, and everything else so. I did yeah. not have the concept mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I so I booked the meeting then I called my best friend and I said I need you to book off next week because we got to figure this out <laughs> and we took a yeah. huge piece of paper we sat on my kitchen floor yeah. and, we, and we hashed out a bunch of different ideas mm -hmm. and the idea that kept coming up was this kind of easy everyday cooking mm -hmm. a couple of other mm -hmm. ideas mm -hmm. 
And I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, that's great. We'll work on that. And then, you know, the easy cook, the lazy cook, the short cook. cook. Mm -hmm. And she said, well, how about uncomplicated? And I said, no, 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 because I'm still in the magazine world. Like, it's too many characters. It's too big. Yeah. <laughs> and she said, you know, she said, Claire, how do you sleep on it? Like, I think it's a pretty good title. Mm -hmm. Like, of course, I woke up the next day. I'm like, oh, my God. It's uncomplicated. Of course it's uncomplicated. <laughs> I think it is. It's <laughs> great. Exactly yeah, yeah. Because it captures exactly, exactly what I I think it's a to. terrific title, too, for sure. Thank you. Yeah. And so, and, um, so then I had four weeks. Uh, by that time, I think I only had three weeks. Oh, my goodness. So I sourced a photographer, got a food stylist, developed mm -hmm. some recipes. Mm -hmm. um, we shot some images. Um, and then I, I wrote a proper proposal, like a business. It's mm -hmm. essentially like writing a business plan. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sure. Um, and I took it in and she bought it. So mm -hmm. that was amazing. That is amazing. I, I was going to say, like, mm -hmm. with your friend telling you that it never happens to I anyone. Know, right? Yeah. And now I know. Now that but I'm not surprised with you because you've had so much experience in this mm -hmm. in this industry, and like it, it seems like a natural progression for you, really. Yeah. And because honestly, yeah. first of all, that that penguin wanted something from me, and also by the time I'd done the proposal, you know, it's like when you're in university and they say you got to write an outline before mm -hmm. you write your mm -hmm. essay, and you're mm -hmm. like, oh god. But then, mm -hmm. like, I had the proposal, and by the time I'd done the proposal, I thought, well, if they don't buy it, I'll just publish it myself. Like this is like, <laughs> like I'm halfway there. I love this one. I love right? this book. <laughs> exactly. And I was truly, and mm -hmm. it's a great way to go into a meeting, right? No, yeah. Like, you don't want to buy it. I don't I'll, care. I'll go to, yeah. to the guys over there. Yeah. But they yeah. bought it. Yeah. And, which mm -hmm. is, and I'm so pleased because I love being with Penguin. Mm -hmm. and, and so that was, so we signed the contract in like August of 2016. Mm -hmm. So it's a two year, it's a full, two, it's two and a half years to make a cookbook. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, and to, for, to produce the book, yes, they give you an advance, mm -hmm. but the advance has to cover all the photography as well. Mm -hmm. So the advance had to pay for my photographers, my food stylists, all the recipe development, all the grocery costs, everything. Mm -hmm. And on April 1st of 2017, I submitted a manuscript and 130 photographs. Mm -hmm. Wow. And then they have it for a year and a half, and it came out last October. Mm -hmm. um, but writing the book was, I don't want to say it was easy because it's not easy, but it's so, it's so me. Um, mm -hmm. It's, people say, oh, it took you three years to write the book. I said, yeah, actually, it took me 43 years because mm -hmm. these are the recipes that um, I have been making, tweaking, working mm -hmm. on, researching, studying, eating my whole life. Mm -hmm. There's recipes in there that are my grandmother's. Mm -hmm. There are wow. recipes in there that originally my mom used to make for us. Mm -hmm. um, and there are recipes... You, in, that kind of stuff is usually the thing that really resonates with you, usually, exactly. all throughout your life, right? Because it's, it's usually your food beginnings, and that's usually where you get your, a lot of your influence mm -hmm. from. And I, I write in yeah. a book that... Like when I was growing up, mm -hmm. we sat down to dinner every night. Mm -hmm. like there was mm -hmm. no option. There was no frozen pizza. Yeah. I'm not that old. But yeah. There was no like you didn't. There was no skipping mm -hmm. the dishes, mm -hmm. right? Like, yeah. yeah. And For my sure. mom worked full time and did her master's degree mm -hmm. and had three wow. children. And we lived in the suburbs. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. And you know, lamb chops one night, pork chops the next night, wow. cheese souffle. Like mm -hmm. how? How? How did she do it? How <laughs> yeah. did she do it? And we sat there, and you know, we had to set the table, and we had to clear. Like it was that whole bucolic, like per perfect thing. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's because of this, because we're, we're we've dedicated so much of our time to this yeah. 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 that we feel like everything else in our life is just Not being cut out. Right. <laughs> But there are people now, and you see it, and you people say, oh, millennials, they don't do anything. They're always on their phone. Mm, it's not true. Not yeah, true. No. I actually mm -hmm. love millennials a lot. Mm -hmm. And in the food world, you see the millennials are the ones who are keeping their own bees, making mm -hmm. their own butter, going yeah. and buying a farm and raising chickens. Yeah. Right? Yep. So, Brewing beer or something like that, right? Oh, my yeah. God. <laughs> well, we talked about all the small brews. And the, so, you know, that's, <laughs> and there are people who I know, including myself, who just want to get a home cooked dinner on the table every mm -hmm. night. Mm -hmm. I don't have time, um, and it's and I don't have time to go grocery shopping, and I don't have a, necessarily have a lot of big fancy kitchen equipment, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I want to be healthy, um, but I don't want it to cost too much. But I want everybody to like it. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's um it's old fashioned cooking in a sense, in that it's just. This is what humans have done for our, all, all through evolution. We mm -hmm. fed ourselves with what mm -hmm. we get locally. So, uncomplicated recipes. They are recipes that are easy to shop for, or either lo you know your local crappy grocery store, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or they're already in your pantry. They're easy to prep; doesn't take very long. You don't need fancy equipment. Beautiful. E mm -hmm. Easy to clean up because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. that's always a big deal. It was a, a big deal for us <laughs> at Chatelaine when you were developing a recipe in the test kitchen. You have to do your own dishes. Mm -hmm. If somebody else is doing the dishes, you don't know if it's going to take you forty-five minutes to clean every pot and pan, right. So you. No, that's one of the things that one of my chef actually that trained me <laughs> taught me is he said you always clean up as you're going along. You go, that it's right? it's the easiest way to That's do because right. mm -hmm. when you have that huge pile at the oh, end it's, it's just so dotty right and if it's a Tuesday night like you don't yeah. want to be using your blender mm -hmm. and yeah. the oven mm -hmm. and the barbecue mm -hmm. like come on like one pot one <laughs> so it, it's 
it's a tasty home cooked meal that's on yeah. the table. It's delicious. Mm -hmm. It's I really believe that if you cook your own food, you're healthier no matter what you do. I agree one hundred percent for sure. You're, you're, so you're healthier in your body. You have mental health as well. It's better for your wallet. It's better for mm -hmm. your family. It's better for the planet. It's better for your community. So mm -hmm. it's like a huge impact from a bowl of pasta. Mm -hmm. um, and I agree. It turns out that a lot of people really feel that way as well. And so it's been such a joy to talk to people who have the book and who are cooking from it. Mm -hmm. And they say to me, mm -hmm. it really is uncomplicated. <laughs> because I don't want to fuss either. Yeah, yeah. That's why I called it that, right? <laughs> That's why I called it that. Yeah. <laughs> No, I, I agree with you. It's 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 become so. It's, it seems like a like a really hectic thing, right? And mm -hmm. I, especially with mm -hmm. today, with everything, it's just like go 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 kind of right. Mm -hmm. Even when we get home, it's just like mm -hmm. I gotta do this, I gotta do that, I gotta do this, I gotta take care of some emails, I gotta you know get back to this person. It's just yeah. again going back to this. I think that that's why you know yeah. we have it feels like we have so so little time. But I think that's the convenience thing is almost becoming like thing that, are, that is affecting the newer generations mm -hmm. yeah. and a lot of the way the ways it's maybe it's good because it's provides that convenience but at the same time it's somewhat unhealthy because mm -hmm. it kind of it kind of kills the art of you actually you know taking a little time and i i feel like cooking's always been sort of like a little bit of like a meditation process for me myself oh, personally yeah. because it's like you just kind of zone out from everything that you have to deal with in your life mm -hmm. and you just focus on all those like, you know, yeah. 15, 20 minutes that you have to, you know, yeah. put this and meal together. Yeah, to exactly. Hours, right? yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's just that. And for me, I always think of it as the anchor of my day. And I mm -hmm. come home I, and, and then we sit at the table, uh, you know, no screens at the table, no mm -hmm. toys at the table. We sit at the table, you know, sometimes we stare at each other. We have nothing <laughs> to say, <laughs> but mm. we eat together and pass the water. <laughs> it's like pretty much like, and that is the, it was the anchor of my day when I was a kid. It's the anchor of my day mm -hmm. now. And, mm -hmm. you know, people who say, I, cause I, I teach culinary classes and I, I teach people who've never peeled a carrot, who've never let's not talk about butchering a chicken let's talk about yeah, like actually yeah. t touching a piece of chicken and putting mm -hmm. it in the oven yeah. and I think hey, you're 28 years old like how mm -hmm. do you eat mm -hmm. and so it's the convenience stuff mm -hmm. right it's either frozen stuff or takeaway stuff so first of all financially that is not sustainable like no it's not you're absolutely. never yeah. going to save any yeah. money and mm -hmm. also like health wise you can't like okay you're 25 you can eat whatever you want by the mm -hmm. time you're 35 everything you eat ends up on your waistline so yeah. like, you're going to be upset <laughs> yeah. at some point yeah yeah and it's just like all oh, the packaging like i feel like it's just not sustainable in any possible mm -hmm. way so mm -hmm. at some point you're going to have to learn how to cook and I really I mean one of my other big soapboxes that you haven't even let me get on this soapbox over here, which is we need to teach our children to cook for the love of God. Yeah, mm -hmm. See, for I agree one hundred percent. Body lessons yep. and gymnastics, mm -hmm. both of which my son is enrolled in. But like, <laughs> can we teach our children five? Imagine if every fourteen-year-old on the planet, or at least in this country, at least in the city, could cook five basic meals: one breakfast, one lunch, one yep. dinner, one snack, one sweet. They would be set for life for themselves. Mm -hmm impressing people on dates mm -hmm. and then it would inspire potentially a lifelong hobby so i really think it's an absolute tragedy that we do not teach children how to cook i agree 100 mm -hmm. percent. and um, mm -hmm. i think that you know if somebody if, they, if justin trudeau wins another election and calls me up and says uh you know here's a billion dollars what do you do we'll, we'll put food education mandatory food education in every justin you're, you're listening right i know you i know you watch <laughs> jt <laughs> JT, JT, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, I think I think it would be amazing because I remember you know going back what, like five six years ago when yeah. we had um, Jamie Oliver go to the states right <laughs> he, was, he was doing that oh. whole like uh, mm -hmm. cooking uh, you know, know yeah school revolution yeah. Yeah, yeah 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 like they didn't even know how to you know <laughs> going back to like peeling yeah. stuff right and yeah. I think that it's yeah. another thing too is it's almost like what you were saying you know with this book it's almost like it got passed on to you with generations from your 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 yeah. mom and your grandma, mm -hmm. right? It's it's almost like you have that little small connection to that past, right? Mm -hmm. That allows you to kind of carry forward and maybe you know even put your own spin on it, on things, right? Or mm -hmm. adapt it or change it, you know, in, in a certain way. But I think that it's 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 great to always look forward, but at the same time, you have to have a little bit of you know kind of a, th a thing to bring with you mm -hmm. from throwing the past too right and that's a big thing for me i actually write mm -hmm. about that because mm -hmm. I, my mom's mom 
uh, died when I was two, so I never knew her. I actually only knew one of my grandparents. Mm. Um, but my mom's mom, I know her from the recipe cards that my mom has. So it's the no handwritten way. recipe cards. That's incredible. Mm. And so I don't have any memories of this woman, but I know her recipes. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it deeply connects me to her. I know who she mm -hmm. is because of the way she wrote mm -hmm. a recipe. You know, mm -hmm. in one of the recipes, it's just she says, uh, it makes in the usual way. So you're like, mm -hmm. okay, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> And in another recipe, she'll say, oh, I, this needs a bit more flour. Uh -huh. So it's this, like, I feel like I know her, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. even though I don't. And yeah. it's through the recipes. Yeah. So that's a kind of a little pet project of mine is like researching the recipes of my gener mm -hmm. of my generational ancestors. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I would love eventually to be able to, to either teach a class or write a book about sort of your family tree via recipes. Mm -hmm. That's a, such a cool idea. You know, that's really so neat. Yeah, yeah, and, for sure. So that's the idea for the second book, right? No, the second book is actually <laughs> I'm in conversation. Oh, okay. with, oh excellent. Uh, okay. Uh, we'll see. Yeah. Well, TV, okay. TBA. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. The, it's wonderful to be asked for a second book, and so yeah, the mm -hmm. next book uh, won't be that book. Maybe book three. Yeah. 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 Fantastic. It's, it's that's amazing. Great. Just like going off that like point that you made like just now. Um, not only like does food bring people together, but like. You really learn a lot about people mm -hmm. through, you know, their food. Mm -hmm. And, like, it goes back to Arden's point earlier that he made as well. Like, in that, like, you know, the more you travel, like, you know, the food is a big part mm -hmm. of, you know, the, the cultural aspect that you, you learn, like, with, with traveling. Like, it's not just, you know, observing people and, and their everyday lives, but, you know, it's, it's learning about them and the way they think through their food. And I mm -hmm. think that's, you know, for sure a big tell teaching point. Tell me what you point. eat and I'll tell you who you are. That yeah. line, yeah. For sure. Well, yeah. you are what you eat, technically. So it's, you know, whatever you're, you're putting, if you're putting just convenience in, into your gut, right? And then mm -hmm. that's all, like one of the, uh, actually, the things I, w I was reading, uh, I read a couple of years ago, is they have new studies, new developments about how they say that you have like it's almost like a second brain in your stomach mm -hmm. yeah. that affects every, like mm -hmm. so whatever you consume is actually it's all, all related right and like and yeah. like it affects yeah. everything and Illusion, it's just immune yeah, system yeah. is controlling your gut I mean that's mm -hmm. that, that's a whole other beast like mm -hmm. the, when I t talk about that you know when you cook real food you're healthier not just because I think you you're actually going to be healthier, you know what you're putting into your body, but yeah, the, the, if you can nourish your gut, you're going to nourish your brain and then nourish your whole body. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree with that 100%. So mm -hmm. um, that sort of leads me into the other question with um, recipe development, right? Because mm -hmm. I mean, you've obviously spent of years and years and years, you know, involved in that. Tell us more about maybe like some of the interesting things that you learned about like food science. Um, so oh, like, because uh, obviously you're, you're, st you're still sort of, you know, <laughs> I. Maybe you, you, you've stepped away from, you know, directly being involved in direct development mm -hmm. every single day, right, in, in, mm -hmm. in recipes. I mean, I'm sure you're, you're still quite involved in a lot of the things, but, you know, tell us well, what's going on with the industry and, like, where it's sort of headed and, like, what's your vision of mm -hmm. how things are, are going and, like, what's happening in, in yeah, that area? Product development mm -hmm. is, uh, ooh, it's, it's a whole other beast. It's really, mm -hmm. It is very scientific, but it's very strategic as well, especially mm -hmm. working for a private label like I worked for President's Choice. Mm -hmm. um, Which is actually doing some pretty incredible things. I, I've noticed that, especially with, have. like, no, no mm -hmm. food additives and, like, yeah, like and all that stuff like that, that mm -hmm. they're trying to kind of push lightly yeah. for the last couple of years, I've noticed. Well, mm -hmm. when I started there in 05, 2005, um, I remember like PC brand. going. Yeah, there you go. Uh, but I remember Love going us. in and 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 like my first few days in the kitchen, I was working like freelance before I was uh -huh. offered the job. And I remember thinking, oh my god, they actually really care about food. Like I thought it was just going to be some corporate, like oh, let's just put out whatever's going to sell, cheapest product. Um, let's put some yellow added food additive in that, right, exactly. to make it look pretty. But it was like there was an extraordinary <laughs> process. I'm sure they still do it today where uh, at a certain time every morning all the different product developers from all the different um, areas of the store so it's, that's how the product development mm -hmm. is divided mm -hmm. so there's dry goods there's frozen there's cookies and confectionery there's cheese like there's a whole mm -hmm. uh, so and they would come and they would stand together at a table and they would all taste each other's uh, products that they were working on mm -hmm. wow okay and for feedback, really, yeah, obviously, feedback. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And the feedback was never, ever, ever, this is going to cost too much, we're not going to mm -hmm. do it mm -hmm. this way, or, oh, the consumers are never going to buy this. It mm -hmm. was always, what's the best, absolute best version of this dish, mm -hmm. butter chicken, that we can possibly create? Mm -hmm. And then, once we had settled on that recipe, how can we translate that into something that's frozen and reheats 
beautifully for uh-huh. so mm. and I remember thinking my god like they actually really believe <laughs> in what they do and it's true they really <laughs> did believe in what they do and mm. I think that was what re- always made President's Choice stand apart because uh-huh. mm-hmm. they were willing to go that extra mile um, and they had people who were given that leash to say you know what no we're not putting XYZ in there. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. and while I was there they had an amazing team of dietitians there as well who were always on the lookout for um, like what's happening in health and because you know health changes very quickly like of course mm-hmm. the, the study of what's good for us is very young. it's a very young science and so mm-hmm. science well it's, it's like what was acceptable science. 30 40 years ago is just because, completely been revamped right like yeah, we because, went like with like yeah. food pyramids stuff like that right exactly it's just, and that's just because science is always changing so people are always on the lookout for that and then of course people looking out for trends and what cuisines or what ingredients are coming in and all that stuff so it was a very uh, a really detailed and rich process of getting to those products but then but then of course you'd see the scientific side and that's why product development takes so long so you get this amazing recipe uh-huh. and then on this like production side okay mm. well how, how much does it cost uh-huh. and can we source uh-huh. the right cherries for this and what if that source then you know then that they have a bad year and they don't get a good harvest of cherries we've got to find another like uh-huh. that is so complicated and the millions of tiny decisions that go into just one frozen dinner or one jar of marmalade um, and the level of the standard that has to be hit every single time in terms of quality mm-hmm. and then also in terms of like consumer safety so very very complicated process and I've had people come to me and wanted me to consult on oh I've got this great idea for a new food product it's gonna to go to market yeah well you know what hold it right there because it is a very very complicated process mm-hmm. long uh, dragged out process probably long too, right? dragged yeah. out. again consistency like if I buy this jar of tandoori cooking sauce today mm-hmm. and I buy it again in six months it's got to be identical mm-hmm. Not, and yeah. it's got to work for me the same way so it's just a very layered process um, mm-hmm. really really interesting very much creativity and business all together in one mm-hmm. um, and I mean the thing is that as food science evolves and people evolve mm-hmm. uh, you know w- where was plant-based eating 10 years ago? Where was yeah. vegan cheese 10 mm-hmm. years ago? Mm-hmm. It was nowhere. So I think that uh, people will continue to evolve, evolve, which will continue to inform product development. And I think that that's just it just feeds itself. So, you know, in five years, who knows, keto may be dead and everybody mm-hmm. may be on like the white bread diet. <laughs> highly doubtful, but you never know. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, and I think the companies will just continue to keep up with that. And the ones who are able to do it quickly and turn around quickly are going to be the the ones that succeed mm-hmm. I, you know it's funny I feel like um, they're always trying to you know f- rush and sort of fight for the next best thing that's sort of coming out but at the same time when we go back to the actual usefulness of food it's mm-hmm. almost like we're always going back to you know like the, the basics and the, like the, yeah. the beginnings right so mm-hmm. whether it be something like even <coughs> the raw food diet right or sure. stuff like that because mm-hmm. yeah. it's just, it's really just going back to just organic growing stuff right like yeah. <laughs> And that, that was one of my things in my business, mm-hmm. in my sort of mission statement. Mm-hmm. Um, when I talked about how I figure out what I do, I always just want to use just real and processed ingredients. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not talking about organics or anything like that. Sure. But like I don't, of course, yeah. I, I don't ever in the book, I would never call mm-hmm. like a particular brand of a sauce. Of mm-hmm. course, yeah. You know, canned tomatoes, obviously, mm-hmm. sure, no, but like buy whatever brand you mm-hmm. want. Mm-hmm. Um, real ingredients, uh, real sort of basic building blocks that you can then do things with Uh because I never want to lean on one particular product first of all because it's not accessible to people like I I agree you know what if Susie and Susie and Marie can't get my Uh Mm. God, I got this, bought this amazing miso condiment last week. It's amazing. I would love to cook with it, but <laughs> you got you got to say what it is. Exactly, mm. right? And what, I have family in England, like they can't get it. So <laughs> you know, I, you know, I can rep, try to replicate it with stuff that they can. So that's just one of those mm-hmm. things. Um, I, I think we're kind of spoiled a little bit here too, especially in GTA, because oh, you, you get so many more ingredients. Yes. <laughs> you go to like an Asian store, right? Yeah. Just yeah. down the street, and yeah, yeah. Right. find like you know. 50 different varieties of rice or something, right? That's like right. it's just it's, And my time mm. at Chatelaine really trained me hard uh-huh. on this because Chatelaine is a national magazine and it literally did go into every small town, every you know, one stop light uh-huh. house mm. in the middle of nowhere. 
We could absolutely not put in a bunch of weird ingredients that people couldn't get. But we get letters, people would be upset. And as a recipe developer, that's the thing you want the least is for <laughs> the reader, your end user, to be upset or annoyed mm -hmm. with you. So yeah. you do everything you can. And I remember one year we did a story about Thai food. I mean, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> and having been Green Thailand, curry paste. Many times, Where do I get that? You know, like, yeah. Okay, well, here are, here are all the ingredients in Thai food that we need mm -hmm. that I can easily get in Toronto. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, that you cannot get anywhere else. Yeah. And so we sort of methodically had to go through, instead of wild lime, can we use lime zest? Instead of tamarind, can we use a combination of mm -hmm. sugar and vinegar? Mm -hmm. And it, we had to go through every single thing. The end result, like the pad thai that we came up mm -hmm. with, tasted good. We should not have called that bad tie. Like, <laughs> but I think that's a, you know one of the things that a lot of food writers can be sort of blamed for too, because a lot of times they'll, they'll create something and be like, yeah, this is the authentic yeah. version of pad thai. But when yeah. you're like, when you actually know that pad thai is made with you know candle nuts or something like right. that instead of macadamia nuts, taste. which can yeah. be used yeah. as a substitute, yeah. right? Yeah. So, exactly. and the, and then like you're like using like ketchup instead for like oh. which most restaurants actually use, which is oh, yeah. which is really kind of bad, right? Because if you <laughs> yeah. well, so if they call themselves authentic Vietnamese yeah. and Thai yeah. restaurants, yeah. right? Well, that's uh, why when you go to Thailand and you eat something, you go, oh my god, this is what it's supposed <laughs> to taste like. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. more sour, it's more spicy, it's more mm. intense than anything I've ever had at home. And anyway, mm. that's a whole other, like, yeah, it's there's a, a whole a, conversation mm, about I, like, sure. what is authentic food. Of course. Mm. Uh, you know, but for me, what makes the difference is I'm not ever, I'm never going to ask you to go out and find more than one mm -hmm. slightly unusual ingredient. Mm -hmm. And slightly unusual for me is like miso paste. And mm -hmm. in my crappy little downtown grocery store, which basically has almost nothing, they have five different kinds of miso paste, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. I trust that um, that you can find miso paste. But mm -hmm. but you know what? I, I think it's just one of those words. It's almost like... If I make it that way and it's mm, special to me right. and I have a specific m memory that resonates with me and when I make it with love, mm. it can be like that's one right. of the best dishes ever. And it doesn't have to be <laughs> like, you know, the standard, you know, Calabrian, Calabrian well, spe specialty, it. right? Yeah. Like that, that was only, yeah. You get a Sicilian yeah. and a Calabrian yeah. and, yeah. and the Sicilian will say, <laughs> how you make tuna sauce? And the Calabrian yeah. will say something completely different. And oh my God, it's just the, the amount of different pizzas that yeah. they have in different regions. Exactly. And then, yeah. I mean, that, that's, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, talk about a little bit about maybe where the sort of because the market of food and food writing and publication and everything that's happening with food is just so overly saturated with mm -hmm. so many people. Mm -hmm. If somebody was to start a career and wanting to kind of pursue a similar career, mm -hmm. maybe and obviously they, they, they wouldn't be able to do it, you know, with everything that's, that's changed in the last 20 years, especially with like, you know, mm -hmm. working for a magazine yeah. and stuff like that, right? Yeah. But like, where where would they start looking for opportunities mm -hmm. into getting into into things like that, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's, I mean, the food uh, kind of superstar status has taken off with, you know, the food networks and you know the progression of things into the internet and how it sort of evolved and all the big brands sort of jumping on board and kind of trying to you know be their own like authentic version of you know what what can be brought brought forward with food as well. But like, what are some of the patterns that you notice maybe that are sort of just evolving or just coming up? Mm -hmm. Can you tell talk about that? Because you're obviously you're heavily involved in the, in this, yeah, right? So. Yeah, it's, it's difficult mm -hmm. uh, to identify mm -hmm. a good place to sort of start. Um, the only thing I can... I like asking challenging questions. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not all the time, but... Um, I mean, one thing that I've always recommended to people who want to get into food writing is to actually work in food. So mm -hmm. if, if you tell me when I... And I had people come to me for advice or interns when I was at the magazine and say, oh, I just love to cook. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. that is awesome, fantastic, mm -hmm. great. Mm -hmm. Go out and work in the food world, uh, you know, work in a grocery store, work in a restaurant, work for a catering company, and mm -hmm. you'll see a different side of food, and that will start. It's sort of like traveling, yeah, right? Yeah, like it'll absolutely. start. It'll start to help you to start seeing self awareness. Food. Right? It's mm -hmm. in a way mm -hmm. that's just. I mean, I'm sorry, but if I have to read one more blog, and I know this is not a popular opinion, <laughs> one more blog about like. When I was little, my grandmother used to come over on Sundays, and she would make her like that's fantastic. Her, I love that. That's meat great. sauce, right? Whatever it is, yeah, that's um, true. Like th that's fine, and I think if you <coughs> it's a great way to get your to practice your writing and to to work on that. But really, what I think for me, the thing is that you need to think about the person who's actually using that information, mm -hmm. using mm -hmm. that content, the the end user, the reader, the person who's either going to 
if this person wants to enjoy a story, then write a great story. Mm -hmm. If this person actually wants the recipe, give them the freaking recipe and make it a mm -hmm. great recipe that's mm -hmm. reliable, that's mm -hmm. easy to shop for, that won't piss them off. But if you're trying to, if you're getting at it because you just want to make a living at it, mm -hmm. it's it's sort of a backwards way of looking at it. And, and I hate to say, you know, you've got to be passionate about something and do it because mm -hmm. just because you love it. But in the food writing world, like, there are not a ton of paying opportunities anymore. Mm -hmm. um, it's sad but true. Like, it, mm -hmm. there, there isn't a lot. But there is still, everybody is still has a unique voice. Every human being who of eats food mm -hmm. has a unique voice. And so you do have something unique to mm -hmm. offer. Mm -hmm. But you have to think about who that is, who you're trying to serve, and what are you trying yeah. When I went to this restaurant, they didn't even take my coat. Mm, mm -hmm. Not really interesting. Mm -hmm. But give me an interesting, give me a hot take, hot spicy take on your particular view on something that maybe I do want to read it. Mm -hmm. Write it really well. Work on your writing. Like writing is a really difficult craft, mm -hmm. and you have to work on it every single day if mm -hmm. you want to be a writer. For sure. Yes. So write something that's mm -hmm. actually interesting, that's worth reading, that people want to read, that people want to share, mm -hmm. um, and create something that's really interesting and exciting. It sounds so easy, doesn't it? Just sounds so easy, but it's really, really difficult. It, mm -hmm. it isn't. It isn't because I think that's just. It's just yeah. how things are, really. And, so. mm -hmm. and don't believe that. Don't to, like. Don't think that you're going to make money in this business. If, mm -hmm. if you're out there, if you're in the world to make money, food writing or writing in anything is the wrong field. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what to, to tell you. Food in general is the wrong field. Like, you know, the, the handful, I was reading a thing on Forbes the other day about the top 10 most influential food YouTubers. Mm -hmm. And one of them is um, Yolanda Gamp. So she's from Brampton. And she's been extraordinarily successful. Is this, sorry, is this Canadian she's, ones? Okay, no, this is okay. international. Okay, international. So, okay, wow. So. Yolanda, she has a mm -hmm. she has a, a, a YouTube channel called How mm -hmm. to Cake It. Mm -hmm. She essentially started that from her basement because mm -hmm. um, she was crazy. Her personality is hysterical, uh, and then it's it started to build from there. So like it it started small. I'm pretty sure she didn't think that 10 years from when she started, she would have a line of bakeware that she was selling internationally, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I'm pretty sure she didn't think that way. Mm -hmm. If she did, God bless her. Soul. I love <laughs> Maybe her. she was like you. She, she had a, you know... Maybe she did. And she had a path yeah. all, all the way, you know. But also, yeah. it's not going to happen tomorrow. Down mm -hmm. to the non-retirement. And right this part. is the thing. Yeah. It's like the whole non-retirement thing. Like, it's <laughs> not going to happen tomorrow. And... Mm -hmm. And it's something I have to remind myself because I'm by far like I'm not making a ton of money right now. And every mm -hmm. not to say I'm destitute, please pay me, but mm -hmm. like it's not. I'm not in it for the money uh, mm -hmm. today. I am in it to have a life, mm -hmm. um, and my life involves paying my mortgage and going for the occasional mm -hmm. holiday. Yes, um, but there are a lot of weeks when I don't get paid. Mm -hmm. I have to kind of be okay with that mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. use that time to plant those seeds so that maybe in a year, maybe in two years, maybe in 10 years, that seed grows into a tree that ultimately gives me an apple. Mm -hmm. So it's a very long, slow game. There is no guaranteed success. Uh, think about your long game and then do something every day that gets you there. Mm -hmm. oh, no. <laughs> so boring. No, it's so not. Boring. But, but you know, you know what? I, I think that that's, that's what a lot of people are sort of missing. That everybody wants the quick solution. Of course, right? yeah. How do I make yeah. a million dollars in you know doing this? <laughs> you know, and please and please do, 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 do it, do it, do it, do it, e-commerce. You know, yeah. Yeah, in yeah. a year and a half, yeah. and yeah. you know, you see all these gurus <laughs> yeah. and whatnot. Totally yeah. right. And, yeah. <laughs> and it's um, and there's so much out there, uh, yeah. which is I think bad business advice. But there's a lot of really good business advice out there. There are great podcasts. There mm. are great books. There are great resources that can really um, encourage you. I do think we are in a gig economy. Like mm -hmm. the world is moving towards everybody kind of having their own their own specialty and that, that they, they can like, bring to the table. Yeah. I'll do anything. You call me up. Mm -hmm. You want me to food writer in residence? Yeah, that mm -hmm. was never on mm -hmm. my agenda. Mm -hmm. But sure, I'll go and do mm -hmm. that. Or you know, again, like who knows? I'm. Uh, I love how how you're always open to like evolution, right? But at the same time, mm -hmm. I, I always see you for, even from the stories that you tell me that. You're always, you know, putting your foot forward, and you're always trying to plant those seeds, like just, mm -hmm. just like you're, you're telling me, right? It's mm -hmm. like, I think that well, that's another thing that a lot of people need to realize is that it's not like a short-term strategy; yeah. it should be a long-term strategy, right? Yeah. So, if yeah. that's the field you want to stay in, start, you know, volunteering, start doing this, you know, really? st start yeah. going and doing cooking classes, or you know, yeah. talking to people, talking or to people, yeah, like, exactly, you know, all that true yeah. networking, and just yeah. find out what's up. And that was a great thing about having my dad, a career fit kind of guy. Mm -hmm. um, 
he <laughs> talked about, you know, find find the circle of people that you, like find the field that you want to be in and then get in there like somehow. Mm-hmm. Like you said, volunteer, mm-hmm. start meeting people, mm-hmm. uh, take, you know, take a job at a restaurant um, because at least you're in the right ballpark and then from that you'll meet people. And if you really want to do this and mm-hmm. you have energy and drive, then it will build. It will build. It just will be slow. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, I know it's not it's not sexy and, uh, it, and that's that's one of the reasons we're doing the show too is because we want to talk and expose a little bit of you know the the like like Anthony Bourdain's book the nasty bits right like mm-hmm. uh, like all the like parts that everybody sort of skips yeah. and just you know shows you the glamorous side of things mm-hmm. just the Instagram picture that yeah. you know the, the final one it doesn't show you all the different steps that you have to take mm-hmm. in order for you to get that picture done right so that's right and the, there is always so much yeah. behind the scenes that nobody ever sees mm-hmm. for sure um, so, and I'm sure I mean, Tony Bourdain right like he mm-hmm. came to his his fame and celebrity later in his life mm-hmm. uh, and ultimately was profoundly depressed mm-hmm. like so there's so much behind the scenes that you mm-hmm. never see and for anybody sure. who's ever worked yeah. in TV you know how much film they how much they film and mm-hmm. how much gets cut oh um, I, yeah <laughs> right <laughs> so you know yeah. that that um, you don't there's a lot that you don't see mm-hmm. um, and so when you're when you are the person who's running the business and you're doing all the stuff that nobody ever sees like mm-hmm. it's not gonna be glamorous every day and my god I booked off Friday to do my taxes it's gonna be awful it's gonna be receipts <laughs> everywhere I'm gonna be drinking steadily through the day like, it's not gonna mm-hmm. be pretty but I can't afford to have an accountant or a bookkeeper right now so I'm doing it myself mm-hmm. There's nothing wrong with that. I, I think that's, exactly. you know, w- w- once you reach that point where you can actually afford to outsource things and you can f- focus so much more on developing your brand or growing it, it go for it. I think that, that that's, you know, it's, it's the best way to approach it. But at the same time, you have to be resourceful. You have to be, yeah. you know, utilitarian in terms of utilizing everything that you have at your, you know, at your hands, hands reach, where if you can do it yourself, by all means. And the, something I, I actually think that was important to me when I was taking that original first leap from my corporate job and mm-hmm. starting my own that and this is maybe I just needed this because of who I am I knew I had a backup there was a backup job I mm-hmm. never really talked about it I won't mm-hmm. even say it out loud now but there's something I could do um, if everything like if the bottom truly fell out and like mm-hmm. I was trying to like I didn't know how I pay the mortgage I knew that there was another kind of work I could go and do and, mm-hmm. and I could just do it Mm-hmm. So that was almost like a sort of a safety net, mm-hmm. right? Like, so either, like, if there's, if it is, you're going to go and work at Starbucks or you're mm-hmm. going to go and work at a call center or whatever it is, because at a certain point, if it gets financially desperate, mm-hmm. right? Like, what are you going to do? Yeah, yeah, something to fall back I can't back go and live with my parents. Yeah. Sure. But like, I have a son, I have a, I have a husband, that, yeah. Yeah. I have a life yeah. that I, so like that essentially it was was really important i needed to know that i there was something i could always go back to mm-hmm. um that wouldn't be pretty but but I'm it's all it's almost like you know it's like what's the worst that could happen right if well yeah and truly when you're standing on the cliff and the cliff is eroding beneath you and you think i'm either going to do this and find out yeah what mm-hmm. it's like to jump off this cliff or i'm going to sit here and crumble and be unhappy mm-hmm. uh yeah, the choice is pretty clear Mm-hmm. That, I guess. <laughs> That's amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, do you want to plug anything other than your book? Like, what, 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 what else is going on with your brand? I mean, obviously, you're doing uh, television with City TV. And yeah, like, so I do uh, um, monthly on, on City Line. Uh, mm-hmm. So my next show is April the 10th, which is, as we tape this, is that's tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I'm on once a month. Um, I do a CBC column on the weekends, although I'm also, I also sometimes do the weekdays. Mm-hmm. So that's CBC Radio 1 across Canada. Mm-hmm. And, Fantastic. Uh, mm. I don't know, I'm going to be the Toronto Public Library's food writer in residence. So that's amazing. I'm going to be giving workshops mm-hmm. on how to become a food writer. <laughs> uh, I'm mm-hmm. going to be talking about my journey. I'm going to be talking about the business of it all. A lot of the stuff that we talked about today mm-hmm. um, for people who are interested. Well, it's in perfect. So it's always like the perfect setup for, for exactly. you know. So I'm, opera, right? <laughs> so I'm doing that. And then, uh, yeah, well, and then, you know, my, uh, my publisher wants another book. So mm-hmm. we're going to figure that out. So mm-hmm. that'll be three years from now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> awesome. And if people want to, you know, like follow you on social media, where, yeah. where can they where can uh, they find you? So I'm on them all. Uh, focusing most of my time on Instagram now, but mm-hmm. I also have a website which is claretansy.com. Mm-hmm. There are recipes uh, on Instagram. I'm Tansy Claire, T-A-N-S-E-Y, C-L-A-I-R-E. Mm-hmm. 
Amazing. That's where I am, and I answer every question that ever comes into my inbox. Tell us about your you know, inspiration for food. Like just you know, lastly, before we start wrapping things up, highlight because that's one of those things that's always, I think, challenging for a lot of the chefs is like yeah. because a lot of the times they'll just get into a rut with a lot of the, the, the things. It's, it's it's easy. It's almost like a safety net that they fall into, right? Yeah. So like, we all, we where, where do you where do you look yeah, for yeah. for that, right? You know, it's a it's a, an analogy that's not pretty, but I think of myself as a whale, <laughs> and you know, a whale swims through the ocean mm -hmm. with its mouth open, and it just takes in Absorbs all it. kinds yep. of, and then through that sifts out its little bits of food. So mm -hmm. I take in a lot. I read a lot of books. I read a lot, um, and I talk to a lot of people, and I do a lot of work on social media. So. I don't eat out a lot because that's not actually where I am. Mm -hmm. I'm, I create recipes for the home cook. I want to empower home cooks. I'm Certainly. not really... Mm -hmm. So sure, I get a little bit of inspiration from restaurants. I get more inspiration from walking around the grocery store mm -hmm. and seeing something that's interesting mm -hmm. or uh, that's something in volume like, oh, grapes are on crazy sale this mm -hmm. week. I'm going to mm -hmm. buy some grapes and then I got them home. I think, oh, now what am I going to do? <laughs> so um, the, the inspiration is, and the other thing is I don't really follow food trends. Mm -hmm. You know, like mm -hmm. I think vegan eating is interesting, mm -hmm. fine. I think the Instant Pot is interesting. Those are two massive huge yeah, yeah. things mm -hmm. happening right now. But Instant, Instant Pot is kind yeah. of dwindling off now, isn't it? I don't it? think it's dwindling no? off. I don't think that Instant Pot's going anywhere. Isn't uh, it just really just a rebranded crock pot, kind of more or less? No, rebranded pressure cooker. Pressure, yeah, okay. Pressure cooker yeah, fair enough. Brain. Okay, yeah, yeah. you're right. But you're you know right. what? Like, I don't know. I'm, I'm never going to write an Instant Pot. <laughs> never say never. I'm write yeah. a vegan cookbook, but I think yeah. you know. I know. I know my niche. I know where I am, and mm -hmm. uh, it has nothing to do with trends. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Um, okay, do uh, you want to tell us anything else? The last, you know, closing words. I got no, yeah, I can't believe you listened to me for this long. You like matter on this. Well, I'm interested. I like yeah, food. Yeah. I think that it's a, it's yeah. fascinating. You had a, such a incredible mm. career and <laughs> such different and diverse, you know. Mm. Spectrums of food and yeah. the fact that we're able to land you here today and have mm -hmm. you talk about your journey, you know, across the different spectrums. Um, I think it's incredible. It's, mm -hmm. it's it's fascinating to listen to somebody who's done so many different things in, in that specific industry because a lot of the times you see somebody who just you know they'll pick one specific area. So they'll be a chef, right? For example, and they'll go and like study with some. Some chefs somewhere in Italy, and then they'll come mm -hmm. back and they'll, they'll open up like a you know fancy restaurant that only does the, this type of molecular gastronomy and like something something along those lines, right? Mm -hmm. With you, it's like you're able. It's it's almost like you're going back to your analogy with with, with what you were saying with the whale, right? It's like mm -hmm. you're able to absorb so much, but also are able to make it almost like you know uh, almost like an accessible version of things, and that's mm -hmm. it, right? right? So mm -hmm. and, what, that, and and that's. That's it, it, what it is for me. That's my mission statement: is to em empower home cooks mm -hmm. um, to cook for like to cook for themselves. Like it's mm -hmm. it's not complicated. Uh, you can do it um, if you make it a priority, um, and and it doesn't have to. You know, there's when you watch the the Food Network shows or you look at all the beautiful stuff on Instagram, it can be easy to think that cooking is intimidating mm -hmm. or that it's difficult or that you can't do it. Mm -hmm. But I'm here to tell you that for thousands of generations, humans have cooked for themselves. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, do it, mm -hmm. try it. And if you mess it up, you still get three chances tomorrow. So, like, <laughs> no, low, very low stakes, right? Yeah. Like, you can always yeah. have a bowl of cereal for dinner. Yeah, um, yeah. So, um, so that was, um, <coughs> you know, that, that's one thing. Yeah, I, I did just think of one thing that was, it's interesting when you talk to somebody about mm -hmm. your life because you things come up that you get I to reflect really on. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I remember when I was in undergrad, so I was taking the degree. You know, and this, that's what you did. You just graduated high school. I was mm -hmm. a really good student. I went to university, um, and I remember in my last year thinking, "What am I going to do? Like, I have this Bachelor of Arts." Uh, I guess I should go on. Like, I, you know, you're trying to figure out what are you going to do. Mm -hmm. um, it's really hard when you're that old. You think that you have, like, every decision you make is going to just completely affect the rest mm -hmm. of your life. Even though mm -hmm. it's actually not. And I remember um, uh, my parents sent, uh, my birthday's in March, and that I was just, so I was just about to graduate, and my parents sent me a book called Becoming a Chef. Mm -hmm. They knew how much I loved food. They wanted me to be a doctor mm -hmm. or possibly a lawyer mm -hmm. or possibly a grade school teacher. But well, they did the, not want me know. to be a chef. And they <laughs> sent me an amazing book called Becoming a Chef. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking, like, it, it was their blessing, mm -hmm. which allowed me to give myself my own blessing to mm -hmm. think, 
this is something I really love doing. <laughs> Maybe I could make a career out of it. <laughs> and it was that real turning point to think that something I love doing could actually turn into my career, <laughs> which yeah. I think a lot of people don't allow themselves uh, permission to do that. You think if I, I, ha- if I, I have to have Absolutely. a career mm-hmm. in something, I have to go be an accountant or whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if sure. there's something that you love doing, it could be, I mean, it could be lifting weights. It could be cross-stitching. The world is so open right now mm-hmm. for opportunities for that kind of stuff. You don't have to be an accountant. Mm-hmm. God bless you. I love my accountant. <laughs> He's still the king of my, my world. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the world is so open now that you mm-hmm. can take that thing that you love and mm-hmm. actually, if you're smart about it, make it into a business. Yeah, and, and the internet for sure has you know made it that. I mean, yeah. there's... You know, there's there's eleven year old kids on Instagram what the hell? making thousands, right? making thousands yeah. of dollars selling or you know like, toys. You can go to Etsy and yeah. literally do anything that you want <laughs> and pay the money. So, yeah. So like, you know, what, or stamp something in metal and For send sure. it to you. Like, yeah. Well, yeah. And I think that also the opportunities that we have in this country alone. I mean, the, the accessibility of everything being online mm-hmm. versus if you go somewhere to like even like I don't know some uh, you know smaller country in Asia or somewhere in like mm-hmm. Africa where mm-hmm. you can get access and yeah. it's so much more convoluted and so much more difficult for you mm-hmm. to start your own business right mm-hmm. I think that we're we have all the you know tools that are resources uh, yeah, all the resources yeah. the, uh, at a hands reach and I think that it's just <coughs> it's, it's like you said it's like I think a lot of people are just kind of and it's all, almost like true with with your, the path that you've told us too it's almost like you had a very traditional kind of education and almost like a progression Mm -hmm. but at the same time it's like you took chances on so many different things Mm -hmm. to kind of get to where you are but at the same time I think that you've had you know a really fascinating career and we've loved talking (laughs) to you and thank you so much for coming I'm only 21 I have a lot of years left I thought you said 20 (laughs) (laughs) thanks guys this is really fun no thank you thank you for coming it was a pleasure I think that we're able to you know provide some sort of small tidbits of wisdom with Mm -hmm. a a lot of your experience too you know anybody that's contemplating you know starting and and doing their own Mm -hmm. thing right so Mm -hmm. that's essentially why we we started this podcast and i think that you've provided a lot of the inspiration i think uh, i just want to thank you for for coming and Mm -hmm. talking to us today and you've been incredible uh, one thing that we wanted to mention is you said that you wanted to do a giveaway. Yeah, yeah, I'll sign this <laughs> yeah, book. And, absolutely. Uh, you guys can figure out who you want to give sure. it away to or awesome. whatever. So we, yeah. we'd love to, uh, to to give it away to somebody. And uh, I think what we'll do is we'll, we'll figure out uh, how we'll run this contest. And maybe, you know, uh, whoever sends in maybe some sort of, some sort of a, a, an inspirational recipe of sort that you know yeah. maybe we can we can forward it to you and you sure. you, you can pick the, the recipe right yeah, so you, you know maybe we can have some sort of a canadian theme to it as well yeah thank you so much uh thanks guys uh thanks for watching our podcast thank you claire thanks for coming mm-hmm. take care bye bye <laughs> see you guys